It all starts with an idea. A brilliant way to move entire industries forward with software and services that drive real business outcomes. And from that idea, we act. Building on our trusted domain expertise, strong partnerships with customers, and good old-fashioned hard work. Because at Honeywell, we understand that it's never just one and done. Software success is about products that get better and smarter every day. But mostly, it's about building relationships that stand the test of time. Together, we can co-innovate to bring game-changing solutions to life like tackling carbon reduction by managing fugitive emissions, better managing the workforce so your best and brightest are always on task, helping critical infrastructure stay online by detecting the latest cyber threats and accelerating quality and innovation in important new medicines. From smarter, healthier buildings to more fuel-efficient aircraft, we're committed to the one thing that binds us all, connections between our customers, your customers, and the planet. This is the shape of modern industrial software, delivering intelligent, sustainable, safer, and more secure outcomes. It's not the future, it's real, it's now, and it's here. Please welcome to the stage, President and CEO, Thank you, and uh, welcome to Honeywell Connect. Um, this is a, uh, an exciting event for us, and uh, two times a year we gather together to share exciting news about what we're doing in uh, Honeywell Connected Enterprise and to uh, share some exciting news and innovation around uh, Honeywell Forge. Um, Today's event, uh, it's a uh, virtual meeting, but uh, we're broadcasting live here from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And um, we also are joined by, I believe it's a couple thousand uh, viewers from, uh, from around the world. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to all. We, uh, we have quite an exciting uh, agenda ahead. The uh, objective of Honeywell Connect is to really to bring together a, a community of Forge customers, users, partners, and, uh, and industry experts. And um, today we'd like to uh, share a little bit more about the uh, Honeywell Connected Enterprise story, the, uh, the journey that we're on. Um, we are also going to introduce an exciting set of, uh, of new products in uh, really building on uh, the, uh, the solutions that we discussed about six months ago uh, at, our, uh, at our first Connect event. Most importantly, you also hear exciting stories of impact from our customers. And uh, then we'll also share some perspectives from a variety of thought leaders uh, and industry experts. So uh, you can see we have a, a jam-packed agenda. And um, most notably, we'll uh, have some great discussions on the topic of digitalization in, uh, in industrials, in supply chain, in buildings. We'll also uh, discuss how Forge can enable energy optimization and carbon reduction. And uh, we'll also then focus on OT cybersecurity uh, and uh, some of the increasing vulnerabilities and risks uh, that we see. And uh, most importantly, how, uh, how Honeywell can help our customers. So throughout the, uh, the program, you're going to hear directly from those customers on how Forge has, is helping to uh, deliver more intelligent operations. Just uh, maybe by uh, way of background, uh, a little bit about uh, Honeywell, a little bit about Connected Enterprise. Um, we're a $35 billion industrial conglomerate. However, uh, we're a conglomerate that's under a transformation of our own. Uh, we're uh, transforming a sort of a legacy conglomerate to a, uh, a real software industrial. Honeywell itself is uh, comprised of five strategic business groups, of which Connected Enterprise is one. Um, these uh, business groups are really focused on serving end customers uh, in a set of vertical industry segments that include aerospace and defense, 
uh, building technologies, performance materials and process industries, and safety and productivity solutions. Uh, my business, Honeywell Connected Enterprise, is the fifth uh, strategic business group, and we're focused on software. And we work across the entirety of the, uh, the Honeywell portfolio. And so uh, if you, <clears throat> as, a, uh, as a customer, are undergoing a digital transformation, Connected Enterprise is, uh, is ready to be a, a true impact partner in uh, those types of transformations. It's our software that really enables Honeywell to uh, deliver outcome-based solutions. So we combine software along with products and technology, with projects, with uh, services contracts, and it's that combination uh, that create outcome-based solutions that are really focused on operational performance improvement. Honeywell Connected Enterprise, uh, we've been in existence for about four years, uh, and we're increasingly becoming an even more important part of the overall Honeywell portfolio. We are uh, a business that's growing three times the rate of the rest of the Honeywell businesses. We are uh, really kind of leading that software industrial transformation inside of, uh, of Honeywell. And um, we're the organization that provides the consistent and reliable approach to how Honeywell develops and deploys cloud-based uh, software uh, across the company. So, uh, you know, it's a real privilege for me to lead Connected Enterprise because I truly believe that we represent what Honeywell will become. And that is that we'll focus on um, being software-led. We'll uh, deliver outcome-based solutions to our, uh, our customers. And uh, those solutions will have a dramatic impact on operational performance and ultimately lead to a uh, return on investment for our, uh, for our customers. So as we continue to grow um, Honeywell Connected Enterprise, we've, uh, we've grown to more than 3,400 employees around the world. Uh, that includes more than 1,800 uh, software engineers and 150 data scientists. But what we also do is, is we combine, um, as we engage with our cu customers, we provide not only software expertise, but uh, domain and industry expertise. And that's what I think really makes these uh, Honeywell outcome-based solutions uh, distinctive. So at Connected Enterprise, our, our mission is very clear. We, uh, we measure our success by the uh, impact that we have for our customers, and we do that by de developing and deploying world-class software. We're focused on working with our customers on some of the toughest problems and some of the most important pain points uh, that they have. I am uh, absolutely convinced that we have the right products at the right time. And, uh, these are, uh, you know, these are products that I think are directly geared towards the most important issues uh, on our customers' agenda. Just about every customer that I speak with is interested in digitalization, sustainability, and cybersecurity. And no matter which industry um, these customers are in, they're largely driven and, and reacting to the same types of, uh, of market dynamics, the same types of disruptions that they're, uh, they're facing. First and foremost is the explosion of data. And as we connect uh, all these end, uh, end devices and, uh, and assets, we're generating tons and tons of data. And so how do we use this data to provide insights that ultimately can be used to deliver uh, operational performance improvements? As we all know, there's a real premium right now on uh, being placed on labor productivity, and the skills that are required are uh, evolving uh, over time, and so uh, this is a critical issue for our, uh, our customers. Um, we all know the importance of uh, sustainability, uh, and uh, you know, one of those drivers is the fact that not only are we placing societal value on the reduction of carbon, but we're placing an economic value uh, on carbon. And then finally, as, uh, as we connect all these, uh, all these devices, the, uh, the vulnerabilities and the risks associated with operational cybersecurity um, have grown dramatically. And so uh, 
The connected enterprise value proposition is very clear, is that we deliver intelligent, sustainable, safe, and secure operations for our customers across a wide range of, uh, of end markets. So why is this so hard? Uh, what, what problem are we really trying to solve? Well, the issue that our customers face is that today, individual facilities, whether that's a building or a warehouse or a chemical processing plant, they are really comprised as a, of a unique ecosystem of assets and workers and complex OT control systems, but they're not connected. So much of the data that's used to run a facility, to make operational decisions, to manage performance, this data is compiled and synthesized in homegrown spreadsheets. This is a very manual process. It's both inefficient and ineffective, but it also creates barriers to make operational decisions with the speed and, uh, and the certainty that, uh, that is required. So Honeywell Forge is the game changer. Forge enables our customers to connect those assets, workers, sites, processes to each other, and we do that through our cloud-based software. So by creating a single system of record for operational data through Forge, our customers are able to use this data to make better decisions. Those decisions can be on the shop floor, they can be up through operations management, and ultimately into, uh, into the C-suite. So this is really what intelligent operations is, is all about. So what is Forge? Forge is the application architecture that we use to develop and deploy our intelligent operations applications. As I said, it uh, enables us to help our customers connect assets with uh, sensors that are generating data with the control systems that are running these facilities with the labor um, and the workers that are uh, you know, ultimately operating uh, these processes. Honeywell Forge enables us to create a system of record for operational performance data. It also provides the cloud services that enable us to develop and deploy our applications. And it ensures that our applications have interoperability and our, and our self-service uh, self configuration. Ultimately, Honeywell Forge hosts our applications for Performance Plus, Sustainability Plus, Safety Plus, and Cybersecurity Plus. So this approach is differentiated. It, it gives us the, and our customers the, op, the ability to um, greatly reduce the implementation and integration costs while it also shortens the time that it takes to uh, get to value capture through Honeywell Forge. So within Connected Enterprise, we continue to uh, innovate across the, uh, the Forge suites. We uh, will continue to add applications. We'll continue to enhance the functionality, improve the uh, the user experience. And as some of you may recall, uh, in our fall launch, uh, we introduced a whole new set of, uh, of applications, a whole new set of solutions, particularly focused on performance plus sustainability and, uh, and cybersecurity. I'm delighted to, uh, to share today that we've incorporated a fourth suite which is, uh, is focused on safety, which is another one of those things that all of our customers are uh, acutely focused on. Specifically, we're talking about physical security uh, and the safety of the facilities uh, that are being operated, but also, and even more important, is the health and safety of the workers that are, uh, that are operating those facilities. You'll hear more about Safety Plus uh, in the months to, uh, to come. But I would stress that all of these solutions are built in a way that they're applicable across the vertical markets, these vertical mar end markets. Uh, and we add the domain expertise and the industry content to make them distinctive for specific use cases uh, in these markets. But most importantly, they're designed to deliver the outcomes that our customers required. And the outcomes associated with L, uh, intelligent operations are really focused on higher asset utilization, uh, increased labor productivity and operational efficiency, want to help our customers consume less energy. Less energy consumption equates to lower, a smaller carbon footprint, and ultimately to be able to operate these operations assets um, securely. 
these outcomes have economic value to our customers. And so when you hear our customers talk about uh, Forge enabling a 2 to 3 percent improvement in process throughput, or a 5 percent reduction in energy consumption, or a 10 percent improvement in, uh, in labor productivity, these are the outcomes that have a direct impact on the P&L statements for our customers. It could be tens of millions of dollars of impact uh, in terms of those P&Ls, and ultimately, uh, we're able to deliver that uh, oversized return on the investment that they make. Our solutions are, uh, are focused on big, high-value problems that our customers face, and, uh, and that's what Forge uh, is designed, and it's those outcomes that Forge enables. And, um, just a couple of the examples, um, you know, in the uh, sustainability space, it, we, we require a reduction of 25 gigatons of carbon to meet the net zero goals that, uh, that are being uh, expressed by customers around the world. And you think about that, and right now the economic value of a, of a ton of carbon is somewhere between $60 and $80. You can do the math to think about the incredible amount of value that's at stake here. It's our emissions management solutions that help our customers work down those abatement curves to, uh, to meet the commitments that they're making. And we do that by offering a solution that helps to measure monitor, report, and ultimately remediate carbon emissions uh, in near real time. A second area that I talked about is uh, the increasing vulnerabilities and threats associated with, uh, with OT cyber. And, um, you know, as we've surveyed our customers, more than 90% of, of our customers have experienced some kind of incursion um, at the operational level. And as you can imagine, and you've we've all heard in the press, the costs of resolving these kinds of incidents can you know, be in the, uh, the millions, if not tens of millions of, uh, of dollars. You're gonna hear about uh, a new product called Cyber Insights, and this will help our, uh, our customers, will provide situational awareness, all the way from the asset level to the site level, all the way up to, uh, to the enterprise level, to uh, gain more insight around what those um, threats are, what the vulnerabilities, and uh, enable our customers to better manage the, uh, the risks associated with cybersecurity. And finally, our digital twin solutions. Um, we combine asset models with control and data uh, models along with the physical model of the plant or the facility, and this enables our customers to optimize a process for improved throughput and efficiency. And uh, a couple, again, a couple of percentage points uh, for these facilities, uh, you're talking tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of impact on, uh, on the P&L. A good example of this type of impact is, uh, is best illustrated by hearing from one of our customers. We had a recent uh, announcement along with uh, Global Worth. It's a uh, $40 million contract for software and services, and it, uh, it really highlights the power of our Forge Connected Building Solutions, which uh, will uh, deliver a significant return on investment for this customer through energy optimization, asset life cycle, cost reduction, predictive maintenance, and operational uh, savings across a, a, a broad-based building portfolio. So let's hear directly from one of our customers. Building owners are facing a dilemma. How to make a building more sustainable while providing a people-centric environment in a cost-effective way. The enabler for all those key pillars is Forge. My name is Valentin Agu and I'm the Head of Property and Facility Management at Global Earth Romania. Global Earth is a preeminent real estate investor in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, we're the biggest landlord in Romania and Poland. A focal point for a partnership such as the one that we have with Honeywell is the trust the trust in the product and the trust in the teams that are part of this amazing project. We have incorporated Forge and other software and rolled them into our entire portfolio in Romania and Poland. It's software that helps us being the most sustainable landlord and CE. By leveraging sensors and utility data, 
you are able to segment the consumption and then energy emissions and then to take the appropriate measures. All our efforts are guided to provide the best experience possible and to follow all the regulations in terms of ESG and sustainability. The building of the future needs to be the place where people choose to go and work. And it's these experiences that we want to perpetuate in our buildings and make sure they meet the highest standards for people to want to come back to the office. I, I mentioned at the beginning that ultimately, you know, we measure our success by the success of our, uh, of our customers. And it's these types of um, outcomes and the economics associated uh, with them that uh, you know are the ultimate measure of uh, of success. And so, as I mentioned, uh, Forge is providing solutions that help uh, this customer reduce energy, improve their operational um, efficiencies, reduce asset uh, life cycle costs, and over the course of uh, the life of uh, of this contract, we'll deliver more than $80 per square meter across a vast building's portfolio uh, in Romania and, uh, and Poland. And so this is a great example of where the, you know, the total investment that's that's required here pays back in less than two years. And over the, the life of this, um, of this uh, contract, there's a more than a five to one return on investment for uh, for global worth. So a terrific example of what we're talking about in terms of the uh, the outcome based solutions. So um, listen, um, I hope uh, I hope you'll find Honeywell Connect to be a valuable experience. I'm uh, I'm confident that you're going to learn a lot, and um, I would encourage you to get the most out of the the next couple of hours. Engage in the content that we're going to share. Explore. Honeywell Forge and uh, all the solutions that we offer, uh, and you know, most importantly, tap into this global network of uh, you know not only Honeywell experts but our extensive network of customers and uh, and partners. So uh, at the end of the session, I'll come back uh, and wrap up, share a few more details about uh, our flagship fall launch uh, program, which will be an in-person event in Dallas, Texas, on October 10th through the 12th. And with that. Enjoy the program. This is Honeywell Forge in a minute. Honeywell Forge is software as a service that helps enterprises deliver real world outcomes for performance, sustainability, and OT cybersecurity. Whether you are capturing carbon, making cookies, or moving cargo, Honeywell Forge unites real time data across assets people, and processes to drive intelligent operations. It helps surface inefficiencies, mitigate risk, and reduce cost. All Honeywell Forge solutions are built on a standard framework with a single login and common user experience, so training is easy. A shared security model to get data safely into the cloud, and extensibility for new functionality. That's Honeywell Forge real-world outcomes for intelligent operations. Please welcome VP, GM, Honeywell Forge and Cloud Operations, David Trice. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, such an exciting time for us to, to continue this journey of, uh, of meeting with you and talk about the new innovations we're bringing to market. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Honeywell Forge today, as well as uh, the Honeywell digital transformation journey. And Jason and uh, Sheila will join me here in a few minutes, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But first, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes uh, unpacking a little bit more about the Honeywell Forge strategy that Kevin alluded to just a few moments ago. Uh, it's important for you to understand that because this strategy ultimately translates into our commitment to you. First of all, around the brand promise, you've heard everything that Kevin said is that we're focused around outcomes. These outcomes are important because they are also your number one agenda items. We've heard that loud and clear. We've aligned our strategy accordingly so that we can ensure we're solving your problems. But it doesn't stop there. We also want to work with you to actually build these products. We want to co-innovate so that we understand your problems in detail and we're translating that into the actual products that we're delivering that you'll use on an operational basis every day. 
And then lastly, it is a promise that we're going to solve these problems. We are in fact our own customer as well, which you'll hear about in a few minutes. And we wanna make sure that we're solving both your problems as well as our own. But it doesn't stop with just that commitment to delivering the right product. We also want to be a contemporary software provider. We're absolutely committed to making the business relationship with us easier than it perhaps has been in buying software in the past, but we also want to translate that to a better user experience and an easier way to control and access an access model in, in, in terms of who uh, gains access to your data and your, your applications internally. We want to make sure that we're delivering a core Honeywell framework that not only solves the problems and the outcomes that we talk about, but also gives you a way to integrate into the large investments that you've made around software and services, uh, whether that be Honeywell or otherwise. And then lastly, we're committed to a SaaS experience. We want to make this self-service, but we also understand we are in the operational world and there are times when edge solutions are required to in order to, 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 to complete the closed loop uh, uh, capabilities that are necessary. That's our commitment to you. It is a promise and it is a software led promise that allows us to deliver the, the next generation capabilities that, uh, that you'll hear about today. I now wanna spend another minute uh, unpacking a little bit about the, the Forge architecture that Kevin uh, referred to a few moments ago. Um, this is an important aspect of how we solve the problems uh, that, uh, that you'll hear about today. Uh, first and foremost, this is all driven by the applications and the problems that you have and the commitments that uh, myself and Kevin have referred to in focusing on those outcomes around operations and energy and emissions and asset performance and worker performance. Those core subject areas are where we're going to continue to invest to deliver outcomes and capabilities to you. That's what most of today will be about. But underneath that, we have a common system of record because a lot of the insights we have to drive in the applications aren't focused on just the silos. They're focused on data that comes from a variety of places and, and is required to bring together in an end-to-end -end way. Solving the problem that Kevin spoke about earlier, where we have siloed data systems today, we're creating that system of record to bring that data together to drive new intelligent operation insights accordingly. Now, we also understand that uh, anything we deliver out of the box is not going to be enough to solve your problem. And so we have this mentality of 80-20. We want to give you 80% of the functionality and then a very simple, no-code way to extend that so that you can solve the problems the way you define it in your operation. That also includes an easy way to integrate. We have to coexist, whether that be enterprise IT systems, whether that be edge systems, we have to make integration an easy way to, to plug into your environment so we can bring together this data to drive the insights that are necessary. Next, we also recognize that we have to be agnostic. This is not a Honeywell only solution. We have to work incredibly well with our own capabilities and proprietary technologies, but we recognize you make other investments as well. And we want to provide the operational insights that span uh, uh, OEMs and vendors and other asset types so that we can help you run your full operation, not just an aspect of it. And then lastly, we're building this for you. This is a self-service capability so that you can take control of your own destiny, whether that be adding users or governing data accordingly. That's what the Honeywell architectural framework is all about. And it you'll, you'll hear more about today, the, the applications that sit on top of this that we're announcing in this launch. So we're very excited about that. Before we go there, however, I, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about digital transformation and the adoption of SaaS applications similar to this architecture. And to do that, I'm going to bring up Jason Urso uh, to tell you a little bit about our Customer Zero strategy and then bring Sheila on as well. Jason? All right, great. Hey, thanks so much, David. It's really great to be here, and we've got some terrific new launches that we're getting ready to announce. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about our methodology and how we create these applications. So, of course, as David mentioned, we build them on a foundation of Forge, but the applications themselves are very highly oriented around delivering real, meaningful, and tangible outcomes that you heard from Kevin. So, in in, in our areas of interest, whether it be industrials or buildings or distribution centers or aerospace, we're finding ways to apply intelligent operations to improve throughput and yield, improve asset reliability, help workers become more 
performant and efficient. We're helping to achieve greater levels of sustainability by improving car uh, and finding ways to reduce carbon emissions. And then finally, reducing your risk profile with some of our cybersecurity applications. So we build this application set using Forge, but how do we know that they're actually delivering the benefits that we set off to achieve? Well, that's where Honeywell plays an important role. Well, you see, it turns out we run industrial plants and we run distribution centers and we have buildings within our portfolio. So Honeywell is our first customer and it is a mandatory part of our release process where we deploy our solutions at our facilities around the world to prove out those meaningful outcomes and learn from that experience so that we can keep improving our applications over time. So with that, we've got some really exciting discussion to happen in a, in a panel. And to have this panel discussion, I'd like to introduce my customer number one, our senior vice president and chief digital officer, Sheila Jordan. Sheila, come on up. <laughs> Welcome, Sheila. So I think what we're going to do is uh, we're going to set up a panel okay. here and uh, we've got a few questions for you Sheila as to how we apply some of our applications within the corporate Honeywell world. Well, and first of all, congratulations. What an exciting yeah. day. As a consumer of software, product launches are so exciting. Yes. So congratulations. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for being here with <laughs> absolutely. us. Absolutely. Great honor. So I, I know we've got a big digital transformation yeah. initiative underway across our corporation and you're leading the charge. Yeah. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what we're actually doing, what, what some of our objectives are and, and give us your perspective on that. Sure, so yeah, Honeywell has been on this digital transformation journey for probably the last five years. I joined a little over three years ago. And this slide actually depicts what that means because we talk about digital, but we don't really get into what does it really mean? And I really believe that this is the ecosystem of dependencies. So when I say that, it really is the infrastructure and the how, what do we do around the operation? So end user devices, laptops, applications, databases, infrastructure had to be kind of cleaned up. We had, we're a 114 year old company that had a lot of legacy technology and we had to clean that up and really modernize that. We did that by modernizing 19 technology platforms. And I do have a rule that is SaaS only it's not SaaS first, it's not maybe SaaS, it's SaaS only, and I'll explain that in a, in a minute why that's so important and why that's such a strategic statement. And then of course data, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, we can think about SaaS and applications and infrastructure, they might change and go, but at the end of the day, you own your own data. And I always say that data is the most valuable asset other than our employees mm -hmm. inside the company. And we've done so many things with data that became insights and then turned into value for inside of Honeywell. The best example is we looked at an enterprise data warehouse internally, Forge is the one we're gonna use for OT and uh, the, the plants and the operational technology. But we did this with the enterprise data warehouse where we actually matched inflation adjusted pricing for when we, had, when we started to see all those inflation costs in 2020. And, we actually delivered a substantial amount of value, like real revenue to the organization because of that. So cost and productivity is one component of value outcomes, but I think we should challenge ourselves to think about revenue and growth as another option. And then where it all comes together, so um, this is super, the, the layers of the infrastructure, but where it all comes together, which is what you guys are also talking about, is, is really these notion of end-to-end -end processes. Because what we're learning is digital is horizontal. Any of us can experience our Amazon experience, right? Well, to go and buy those boxes and buy those things on your Amazon account and get them you know, 24 hours later, what it, what, what it requires is multiple functions to come together. Marketing, sales, branding, pricing, packaging, finance, because you're swiping your credit card. So the thing I love about digital so much and what you guys are doing is digital is horizontal. A digital experience that we offer to our employees, customers, partners, is a horizontal experience. And that's where data is the thread. Data is that thread through that currency that you can actually see and know what David purchased and know David and know our customers and know our employees. So super excited about the end-to-end -end processes. And of course, we're focused on some pretty substantial business models within the company, software being one. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Sheila, it, it's no small task, <laughs> right? Um, no small task. We've got hundreds, if not thousands of systems we are a business much like many of our customers that is expected to yeah. do more with less. Where do you start? Well, I would say again, what we, we had to do here was the layers that I mentioned before is I couldn't move to data 
if I did had old legacy applications. So we had to really start by modernizing the platforms and the technology, and then of course building this notion of enterprise data warehouse. But I do think it's important, the statement I mentioned earlier around why SaaS. And this really begins to explain, you know, why is SaaS so important? Um, when you think about on-prem, as a chief digital technology officer of the company, I have to run everything in the, in the left column. Um, both the application, the infrastructure, I got to make sure it's secure, and you're right, we'll talk about security in a second. The bad guys are getting smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter, and so you got to make sure all this stuff works. And as a owner of the technology, middleware, the operating system, the hardware, the servers, the storage, the networks, that's what you do when you have an on-prem application. When it's SaaS, the SaaS company does that. I buy the application and I own my own data, or we, you guys, we secure the data and the customer data, but everything else the SaaS company does, which is what you guys will be delivering to your customers. So from an overall consumption standpoint, I get the upgrade, I get, you guys will continue improving the technology and the application so it stays current. I don't have to go do a massive upgrade three years later because the application's out of, out of sync. So this application stays current, so I get all that software, and oh, by the way, I get a much more secured solution because you guys or the SaaS company is running all those things in the green bubbles. Yep. So from a cost perspective, efficiency, agile, time to move, time to, mar time to the speed of which you can deliver really just increases across the board. Yep. Wow, that, that's really interesting. And uh, you, you mentioned along the way security and mm -hmm. probably data privacy is, is a, a factor as you think about cloud SaaS. Can you give just a couple of thoughts about that? Because I, I, I know our audience thinks about those things as well and making sure in, in some cases to protect that data feels a little uncomfortable yeah. to go outside the four walls of the yeah. company. Well, so a couple of things. One is I am so excited and I genuinely mean this about what you guys are doing because mm -hmm. Enterprise IT has been, we've been securing enterprise corporate IT stuff, that landscape I just showed you, for years. And you know, it's getting progressively better and progressively better, but again, the bad guys are getting smarter, the, the, uh, the, the attacks are increasing. So it's, it's just a, nor it's a normal kind of way of doing business. But why, why what you're doing is so critical is because operational technology, OT, mm -hmm. in the plants and manufacturing have typically not had the same upgrade on the large OT machinery that say corporate IT has had. So we're all now focused on how do we modernize OT and how do we secure OT? Mm -hmm. So there's really no better time to think about SaaS solutions for OT because that's going to be generally more secured than what we all, we all have in our environments today. So I'm super excited about what you guys are doing. Got it. Awesome. Um, Sheila, you made the comment about um, horizontal and I love that, that mental image. But it also requires then uh, an organization to standardize on business process, on way of doing things across functions that have probably historically said, but wait, I'm different, yeah. or organizations that have said the same. Maybe tell us a little bit yeah. about how you overcome that reality. Yeah. Well, actually, I would just, I would say uh, Honeywell's in, in kind of the middle of that. What I would say is over the last three years, we have done a really good job at um, standardizing and optimizing the functions. So marketing, sales, IT, engineering, R&D, we've got a really good job at the functions. But if you think about it, most organizations are organized functionally. Okay, that's great, but, the, but what did I say earlier? The digital experience is horizontal. So we don't really win together, we don't succeed unless we connect all that across. So that's why these business models are so important that we think about what can we standardize? And the example I use all the time, and I'll share it with this audience, is that you want to standardize those things that don't add a differentiator. For example, we have, and I'll just share this with the group, we have 55,000 <laughs> templates to do our printing labels across the organization. <laughs> 55,000 different templates of how you print a label. Now, how many of you have really noticed the label when you actually receive a package? Do you really stare at the label? Now I know we have to do some for regulatory compliance and there's a bunch of reasons, but maybe we need 10 or 15,000, not 55,000. So that's one of the areas that we, it's silly to not standardize. Another one is 80, 80 different types of an invoice. Well, an invoice is an invoice is an invoice. So let's think about those things we can standardize are really, really, really important. And so again, I go back to, you even see more of this fragmentation in OT and in the sites because each site is a little bit different. So again, when we can bring in software and solutions like Forge that can 
organize the site and really use and leverage the data across the site, it's just a huge value to us as we simplify. Mm -hmm. Makes great sense. And, and uh, as you think about driving standardization and consistency, there's got to be a big prize to, to do so. I know you wouldn't be working on it if, if there wasn't. So maybe you can share your perspective on are there real tangible benefits and how should we be thinking about the benefits? Well, so I always start with the customer as the benefit. Like as a customer and I buy a lot of software from a lot of different companies. And I like it when, when they know me. I like it when I can see easily what I have purchased. I like it when the purchasing and doing business with that company is easy and simple and intuitive. I like it when I can bundle a few things together. So one is the customer experience. You know, make it easy for the customers to actually do business with Honeywell, which I know we're working on. Mm -hmm. The second is, it is simply about, from an execution perspective, as we deploy technology and this technology, if things are standard, then I can go fast. You know, everyone complains sometimes of IT or, or you know, technologists say, oh gosh, how slow they are. Oh my God, they're so slow. Well, the reality is, sometimes we are, but sometimes it's just because we have all these different complexities and all these different requirements and all these things we're trying to manage, every flavor of ice cream, and that slows us down. So where you can standardize on things, I can pick up speed and scale. And again, one of the benefits of SaaS is SaaS does that. When you guys create your applications sitting on Forge, with all the data coming into those applications, that's a standard solution that we can use and pick and choose what applications you want, but I can see the data from all those different applications and, and make, to your point earlier, the, the speed to decision making, the knowledge, the transparency that we see to run the operation is gonna just you know, increase significantly. Yeah, Makes awesome. Sense. So Sheila, data in the cloud. <laughs> It's the big, the big question in our space. Our customers are asking us about it. They're trying to sort it out themselves. Um, we are a regulated business, yet we still have data in the cloud that is secure. H help us and our customers understand how you think about that and kind of the, th the thinking of the strategy going forward. Yeah, I would, I, I mean, again, when I first started with SaaS and data in the cloud, it's like, you know, you, you, everyone in my role specifically will have those concerns. But when you look at what SaaS companies have done, I use Snowflake for our internal enterprise data warehouse. I use Salesforce. I use, you know, most of my applications that we use have all gone to SaaS. And so the SaaS companies, including us now, have an obligation to make sure that data is secured. And so there's all sorts of different levels of security, but I actually think because the SaaS companies, like let's just take Snowflake or, or Salesforce, they have millions of customers they're hosting their customer data on, and those customers, there's no way they're gonna not be secured. So I almost think in some ways, those SaaS companies, like us, we have to secure that for all of our customers, and we're gonna be even more secure than any one individual company because we have, we're hosting thousands of customers' information and data. So I think it's massively approved. I think security of data has gotten to a point that it's, I don't want to say we don't worry about it, but we have, it's proven and it's a lot of, it's, it's used and proven. I do think we have a lot of work to do still with the regulations and regulatory compliance around privacy is going to continue to be something to think through. Right. Well, it sounds like our core mission of getting our systems upgraded and standardized is, is really compelling. But how do you see Forge playing a role within our own digital transformation in-house? I know we're deploying emissions technology and worker efficiency, some of the announcements that we're making today. So how, how do you think about deployment of Forge within our environment? So, so completely agree that we have an obligation to use this entire environment at Honeywell to be Honeywell on Honeywell. So we are absolutely committed to doing that and we have uh, workforce intelligence deployed in a few sites. We have the emissions management with our processing manufacturing and cyber insights is, is mm -hmm. being deployed. And the reason, again, I get, so, I get so excited about this is I just get, I get just as excited about our enterprise data warehouse and the value we delivered by running and operating Honeywell, you know, bookings, billings, inventory, revenue expenses. Forge is the same thing for our operational technology, for our operational manufacturing world. I mean, the, what you guys have created is the same data platform, Forge, but you've got all these different applications that sit on top of it. The data is going to traverse back and forth those applications. We're going to see stuff that we never knew existed, especially Cyber Insights. It's going to tell you exactly what, what assets you have in each site and manufacturing site. And you know as well as I do that we did a few audits and two thirds of a site of any of your manufacturing sites is more OT than IT. Mm -hmm. 
We didn't know that until we did some audits. So when you guys uh, unleash this knowledge, and when I say OT, I mean sensors, and I mean all the different applications that sit in a site. So when you guys uh, tie that together and give that visibility and transparency to the people, it's not just the plant owner, but the person running like the, the whole supply chain and the, the manufacturing, because because they can see the differences and the comparisons and see what manufacturing sites doing better. And when you, all, when you can tie that together through Forge, we're going to see stuff that we didn't even know was possible. So super excited about it. Terrific. <laughs> and, and, and what a great lead in to, <laughs> for us to share some of our exciting new product uh, announcements uh, that we've got across the portfolio. So today w our program is going to be to go through each area and give you some insight into each one of these new product announcements. Uh, in the supply chain area, we're going to have Taylor, our general manager, take you through some of the terrific new technology that improves workforce efficiency within that portfolio. Can't wait to see Taylor come on up and, and tell us about that. In the industrial area, we'll have Sunil lead us through a set of new product introductions that helps drive throughput and yield and, and process efficiency by using some exciting new tools. So David, you, you talked a little bit about plants running often off of spreadsheets and doing a lot of custom analysis. We'll talk about a production and intelligence offering that gives us some new insight, makes it a lot easier for those process engineers, some digital twin technology to help enhance throughput and yield at the customer site. And of course, what we're doing also internally at Honeywell is applying some of our sustainability technologies to have a better insight into what our carbon emissions are, and then validating that we're on our abatement curve using our remediation technologies. And we'll wrap up uh, with, with uh, Sodic in the area of buildings, where we've got some exciting new launches that show how to take a building and turn it into an intelligent entity, understanding how assets are performing, the location of people, the methodology that we use in order to improve energy efficiency, being more predictive and proactive when it comes to equipment. So it's a holistic approach that connects data from a variety of different sources and delivers some big and meaningful outcomes in the building space. So with that, I'd like to thank our panel. Thanks, <laughs> Sheila. Thank you, Thanks Troy. so thank much you. for coming up. David, awesome. for leading us through Forge. A big round of applause <laughs> for the panel. And I think we're going to go to Sunil, who's going to take us through some of the exciting new industrials announcements. Please welcome VP, GM, Honeywell Connected Industrials and Cyber, Sunil Pandita. Hello, everyone. What an incredible day. I am super excited to take what Kevin, Jason, Sheila, and David talked about and bring it down a notch to our industrial sector. In the next 25 minutes, we will do three simple things. First, we'll talk about those business outcomes and how in industrial sector, we are marching towards intelligent autonomous operations. Second, we will talk about the main entree, which is the four key products that we're launching today in the industrial sector. And third part, which is gonna be majority of our discussion, is we'll bring some practitioners some of our customers, but my partners in crime from the IT OT world to actually make this real. So let's start with what does intelligent operations mean? Uh, but before we go into that, there are three big things happening to our industrial customers. First is the macroeconomic outlook is uncertain. Second bit, big part is the energy transition is here and real. And the third big thing that is happening is there is a significant move towards sustainable operations. And to get that in motion, digitization is actually a core enabling lever. McKinsey and company recent survey shows that corporations that are asset intensive and that employ digitization properly yield 10 to 20% of higher throughput five to 50% of operator productivity and consume five to 10% lower resources, especially energy, which is critical for our environment. So let me go through some of the, the real business outcomes we drive and then we'll go very quickly into the products we launch. So first is end-to-end -end optimization. Now you might say optimization has been going on for 30 years, what's new? We are going from one unit 
to many units, to many departments, to many plants and create an enterprise wide optimization. Why? Because the new environment forces us to find new ways of optimization, running our plants much more reliably. But also as energy transitions happen, end to end optimizations provide flexibility so that we can move as the world moves. Second big area is asset reliability. Roughly $1.1 trillion of value lost in the industrial sector, which amounts to 10% of lost productivity. Here, we are bringing decades of our domain knowledge through asset models, through process models, through fault models, and combining it with artificial intelligence and machine learning so that our customers can run operations reliably, but also run to the max possible throughput. The third big business outcome that Honeywell drives is operator safety, competency, and productivity. It is all about our people. One of the interesting stats in our industry is 20% of people in US, UK, Canada, just three big economies, are more than 55 years old. That means in the next 10 years, significant experience is walking out of the door. So we are having the tools that capture that experience, get our new generation ramped up so that they operate the plants safely and productively. The fourth big business outcome is operational excellence. This is leveraging data across the platform from IT to OT, from our assets, from our processes, from our operations, so that operators have things at their fingerprints. Fifth big business outcome is sustainability. Now, 95% of customers surveyed said they are going to increase their sustainability budget from last year to this year. For some, that means emissions, for example, carbon dioxide, methane, fissures. For some, it means changing the fuels you use, like moving to hydrogen. For others, it may actually mean changing operations so you consume less. The last part, Sheila mentioned this, is cybersecurity. 80% of our customers had a cyber attack in the last two years. Two of those five attacks led to unplanned downtime. This is not important just for the operator or the CEO. This is a board level conversation and Honeywell is committed to driving these business outcomes. Now, let's quickly get into the four key products we are launching, which are in sync with the six business outcomes we talked about. First is Honeywell Process Digital Twin. Here, a, a digital twin is a digital replica of the process or the plant. The key thing here we are driving is we are bringing hybrid modeling, static, dynamic, and artificial intelligence to make sure that your digital twin provide the right advance, advice at all times. The business impact you all drive is better operating margins because you can find issues through process modeling before they become problems. Also, operational efficiency becomes key because you can look at the process digital twins and make sure that you can close the loop much more effectively because you can now figure out issues way ahead of time, allowing you to close the loop quickly. Second big product we are launching, very excited about this, is Honeywell Connected Workforce Competency. Here we are taking our training software and we are putting it online. The big change here is many times our, our customers buy our software and it becomes shelfware. The reason is plants move. So unless you keep them updated, it's not exactly current. This is an exciting idea to make sure real data goes through these, these models so we can use them not just for training, which is the worker productivity, but also leveraging running the plant like optimization. Third big part, which, is, which I'm most excited about today is Honeywell Forge Performance Plus Production Intelligence. This is what Jason, Kevin, David, and Sheila talked about. This is about bringing data from different parts of the plant into a much more user-friendly environment. Single sign-on, easy to use. Imagine if you're a field operator or you're a process technician and instead of having 
eight different applications where you pull data into Excel. You come, you enter, and you see a dashboard that tells you everything you need to know. You have intelligent search that allows you to search things that you're looking for based on Google-like search experience. And that's what production intelligence is. It allows us with throughput, it allows us with utilization and availability. Last but not least, Unisim design for hydrogen and carbon capture. Unisim design has been used for designing the plant, running the plant, and optimizing the plant. The key innovation here is we are bringing the sustainability side of things. Why is this important to all of you? First of all, when you have models for hydrogen and carbon capture that come directly out of the software, your time to set up that hydrolyzer or that carbon capture unit reduces significantly. So you have significant capex reduction. Second part is as you use these tools to go operate the plant, you consume much less energy because you can now model the processes for carbon capture or hydrogen, thereby making it not only it easy for your PNL, but also for your environment. Now, for us to do these properly, OT data is critical, OT environment is critical, but what is also critical is the IT data. And with that, who else to best tell us the journey than my partner in crime, our CIO, Daniel Evans. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I am super excited to see this list of products come to fruition, but even more excited to introduce our panel and just learn about how they're leveraging our products to digitize and drive value for their customers. So just to introduce our panel, first we have Michelle Twagles from ExxonMobil, who's the Process Operations Product Manager joining us. Thank you so much, Michelle. Secondly, we have Suresh Sudarajan. Suresh is from Suncor, and he's the General Manager of Value Chain Transformation. And then last but not least, we have Marcus Hetland joining us from Borealis, who is the Head of Industrial Digitalization. So Sunil, as you mentioned, when we think about digitization, digitization is crucial for Honeywell and for our company. It allows us to streamline operations. It allows us to improve efficiencies. But last but not least, it really allows us to enhance the customer experience. So Michelle, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your company and how digitalization is really helping you create value for your company, but also value for your customers? Yes, and um, good day, everybody. Michelle Turgis here, ExxonMobil. Uh, sorry, in ExxonMobil, we're one of the major oil and gas companies. Um, when I think about digital, uh, what it does for us. Um, if I start with the manufacturing side, um, we're allowing, we're unblocking the organization doing certain things um, that were not possible years ago. Um, it's also accompanying the organization to transform and do the engineering and other services from a central location outside of the manufacturing uh, facility itself across the fleet of, of manufacturing sites. Um, so that is technology that we have at our hands, at our fingertips today, that wasn't technology-wise wasn't possible um, years ago. And so that is one part of the transformation we're, we're going through. When I look at, at the colleagues here um, in, in the panel from, from the other uh, players in the market, I see many of the titles that resonate well with what we do in ExxonMobil. I see the, the value in transformation. And uh, for those um, who have watched the news, um, we have reorganized at corporate level um, on May 1, we've announced that uh, we've communicated on that. And one of the drivers there is to do a corporate-wise transformation of the value chain um, with a, a central ERP system across the whole uh, business lines. And this obviously also impacts the manufacturing sites, manufacturing activities to interface with that value chain and, and to uh, be a different customer, sorry, a different company to the future uh, for our customers. Awesome. You mentioned value chain transformation. Uh, Suresh, you want to tell us a little bit about value chain transformation and what you all are doing at Suncor? Uh, for sure. Thank you, Danielle, Sunil, and, uh, and the rest of the panel as well. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just before I start, a little bit about Suncor. Suncor is the largest integrated oil and gas company in Canada. 
our operations and our, our better way to put it, our value chain is a little bit unique. It actually starts um, uh, from mining, uh, the oil sands, so oil sands development, the production and the upgrading of, of bitumen to crude. Um, it also includes offshore oil and gas, petroleum refining in Canada and the US, and our national Petro Canada wholesale and retail distribution network. So it really quite a quite a unique value chain in that it, it stems all the way from mining and it extends to, to our customer side of the business as well. Um, what I'm gonna do is actually build on what Michelle just said. I think he said that really well. Uh, in terms of digitalization, what I would say is behind the scenes, uh, the implementation of new digital tools and advanced analytics, uh, what it allows us to do is actually integrate information on other technology, transform our business processes by, again, I'm gonna use the words that's been used before, standardizing and simplifying, uh, but it also helps us build new capabilities within the organization uh, to unleash the full potential of our people. Now, all of this is done with the intent to improve our business performance. Uh, in the forefront, what our shareholders and our customers perceive will be, you know, improved personal and social safety, uh, asset reliability, uh, optimized operation that, that uh, squeezes out the highest margin and revenue that we can, better customer offerings, uh, and also improved environmental performance. Um, outside of all of this, we also expect digitalization to help us reduce overall costs. Hopefully that gives you a flavor, Daniel. Awesome. And then Marcus, walk us through Borealis and how you guys are leveraging digitalization for your organization. Yes, thank you, Daniel. So just a little bit about Borealis. So we are a world leading and global provider of sustainable and advanced polymers. We're also a European front runner when it comes to recycling of polyolefins. And we have business divisions that work with uh, base chemicals and fertilizers. So we have a really long experience, decades of experience of uh, polyolefin technology. And I'm also the program manager for the Borsta Digital Twin, as you see here in my backdrop. This is technology that we both operate and that we license. Uh, when it comes to our challengers, I mean, there is one really big challenge for the company as such, and that is the transformation to becoming sustainable. Uh, that's uh, not only ambition that we have, that's the heart of our strategy. And this comes with a lot of complexity because the, we need to transform our assets. We need to build new assets. We need to invent new technology. We need to utilize green feedstock. We need to utilize recycled feedstock and we need to have clean energy and we need to reduce or eliminate our CO2 impact. And while we do all of this, our customers still expect more new products to the same quality delivered on time. And that is just means a big challenge and complexity for us. And this is where I think digitalization will be the enabler to actually achieve this transformation because there are no shortcuts if you want to be truly sustainable. Thank you, Marcus. What a great articulation of, of your business and your business uh, objectives. Let me, let me start with you. Um, t talk to us about uh, Process Digital Twins and how are you and Borealis leveraging it to drive improvements in operations? Uh, you're an operator. Please give us an operator's view of how you actually leverage it on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm, no, no, absolutely. So um, we have come through quite a journey. Uh, working with Honeywell to define and, and develop process the digital twins that will fit for us. Uh, we want to have something that is versatile and that could have multiple use cases and that really would tie the know-how that we have together because we realized we have, it's not that we don't have the know-how, it's not that we don't have any simulations or any type of process digital twins, but nothing really tied all of this together and a lot of things were left on the shelf and not really generating value after they were first introduced. So of course the objectives here is to maximize the throughput of our processes, uh, but also to support our product development and scale up our engineering processes um, and the whole collaboration across Borealis because it's not only in one location. We are, we are a global company and we want to support our plants wherever they would be. When it comes to the process digital twin, I think it was said it's a replica. I mean, it becomes a reference for the plant as such. And that is a very good starting point for a lot of use cases. I mean, on the on the simple level, 
Do you want to monitor your process and understand is everything well or where do I need to pay additional attention? Can I detect deviations? Can I start to detect anomalies ahead of time to make good decisions? And this loop, when the loop is not automated, when the loop is coming out of insight, it's really about decision support. So making good decisions, making our operators and plant engineers spending time on the actual problems and having the tools to solve this in collaboration with experts, wherever these experts would be sitting. Then of course, there are other dimensions to the process digital twin as such as it's a simulation environment. So it can just, it can be used connected. It can be used offline. And the process digital twin from Honeywell provides us with multiple level of interfaces. So you don't need to be a process modeling expert in order to utilize the simulation capabilities and do exploration of what if scenarios or uh, well, whatever changes you would like to introduce in your process or investigate which are, would be the best changes to introduce to your process. Thank you, Marcus. You, you've, uh, you've summarized it very well. It's a technology that doesn't require an expert to drive business outcome. And that's pretty incredible to see how Borealis is using it. Let, let me uh, walk the reverse order of the panel here. Maybe on to you, Suresh. Suresh, from, from what I know, Suncor has taken one of the biggest optimization algorithms uh, across multiple units, across multiple plants that you have to drive real business outcomes uh, for you. Uh, can you provide some color on your journey and how you think about end-to-end uh, -end optimization? Uh, sure, so now, um, maybe at the end, I do have a question for uh, Marcus because I'm very interested in uh, <laughs> digital twins. So maybe I'll get to the question at the very end. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll jump on the journey in here. So our journey actually started about three years ago and our enterprise was looking to understand you know, what is the ultimate value that we can achieve from the value chain and how close are we to achieving that on a day-to-day -day basis? So that was the premise for what uh, we stood up this program within, within uh, uh, Suncor to go and find out. Um, typical process, consulted a bunch of internal uh, subject matter experts or external peers, understand what they're doing. Uh, we did find some gaps and we've been working to close them. Um, rather than giving you a full overview of the program, which I know for sure I don't have the time for, uh, I'll probably talk about one initiative under this program, and it's what we refer to as the near real-time optimization. Uh, now, in any, any typical oil and gas company, uh, we make our plans uh, either through an LP or some other means and expect our facilities to, one, adhere to them and to be nimble enough uh, to make the changes and take advantage of market dislocations or operational challenges that may be occurring elsewhere. Uh, to a large extent, however, to execute this, we're biased on human intervention. And so what this leads to is on occasion, uh, subpar optimization or missed opportunities. What the near time, uh, near real time optimization attempts to do is actually close the gap between the planning layer and the execution layer by harnessing real-time data and to improve asset operation and manage quality giveaway, right? In broad terms, what real-time optimization does uh, is, is four key capabilities. First is leveraging advanced measurements such as NIR and NMR to accurately predict stream properties and fine tune our operations in real time. The second one uh, is about implementing or, or more reasonably refurbishing some of our advanced process controls to manage unit throughputs and other optimization that we're focused on. The third one, this one is truly transformational for us. Uh, it, this is what we call as the plant-wide optimization or the plant-wide optimizer. And here's where we've partnered with Honeywell as well. And what this capability does is essentially stitch all the plant APCs together and it integrates with uh, the LP and other blending applications to provide facility-wide control and global optimization rather than local optimization that APCs kind of go after. And the last capability is, is deploying process digital twins, uh, very similar to what Marcus talked about and we're, we're in the early stages of that. And this is where my question is as well, Marcus, is you talked about the various use cases of process digital twins and um, one of the use cases that uh, we have been thinking about is around 
you know, the ability to demodel neck assets as well as run the assets closer to the safe operating limits. I'm just curious as you, you're uh, further ahead in this space, have you actually found that that use case actually holds promise uh, and that you can actually de-bottleneck units and run it closer to the safe operating limits? Yeah, so thanks for asking, Suresh. Um, we haven't done actually the bottlenecking scenarios, I would say, but I mean, the first proof is that once you connect the model of your process to the twin, you can observe if the performance and the calculations are according to the real performance. I mean, this is like a very, very simple way to just observe that you're doing the right thing. Uh, then you can have confidence is that, you're, that your model is accurate. So for us, a use case that is very important is then part of the product development and preparations for test runs, introduction of new catalyst, introduction of new products. And here it has been clearly helpful in these, in these preparations where many times in the past, it was a little bit not so proactively taken. Here you can run through everything in a really clean simulation environment and prepare for the actual world test run where you also have a digital twin connected. So it basically helps you in two different dimensions, I would say. Um, the bottle decking, uh, definitely, uh, that's also a possibility because the same model works for engineering purposes as it works for operational purposes. Thank you, Marcus. And so, so maybe if I can ask a question back, is that okay? <laughs> Go for it, Marcus. No? For sure. <laughs> yeah, because I have an APC background, so I was just wondering to what extent you use uh, what to what extent you use empiric model versus to what extent you would use machine learning models or simulation driven models for your for APC and your optimization. That's a that's a brilliant question, Marcus. Uh, so historically, we have used empirical models. That's what it's been based on. Uh, as part of our new digitalization transformation, we have actually started to embark on using machine language and, and AI as part of our model development as well. Uh, very early stages in there, but very promising results from what we've seen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you both. Hearing you speak gives a process engineer and a geek like me goosebumps, so thank you. <laughs> and the second thing is Marcus and Suresh, next quarterly steering committee meetings will only be in summer since you went off script. Uh, now let's, let's go to Michelle. Michelle, um, ExxonMobil and Honeywell have had a, a relationship for decades, more than 20 plus years. And you have seen operators view to go from point solutions to looking at end-to-end -end business outcomes. Can you comment on that journey and um, talk a little bit about your experience and business outcomes? Yes, thanks for, for asking. And, and so it's no secret that uh, both companies um, have been uh, collaborating for, for a long time, which translates into a quite significant footprint um, of Honeywell products within ExxonMobil. Um, the question brings us back to, to a point that, that Sheila articulated earlier um, around this horizontal digital layer. Um, if I look what we've done in ExxonMobil over the last years and then and decades is we have been on a mission to perfect business process by business process, capability by capability, or software by software. And that mission has been uh, very successful for us. Where it brings us today is a big opportunity to integrate across those capabilities. And if I look what, what it does to, to our company, first benefit is very simple. Today, with individual products, we use human beings, we use our colleagues to take output from one system, do something with it, upload it in the next one. And so that efficiency, when you integrate across, is an obvious one. It also cuts across the learning curve uh, when you bring in uh, new people or you rotate your staff faster, getting that end-to-end -end flow and you get an efficiency there. That is not the real purpose while we do that. Real purpose is to get the data meaningful across the different uh, capabilities and get one end-to-end -end flow, which then allows you to do your analytics across all. And that analytics in the first place is um, very traditional, human beings analyzing the data. In a second stage, you, you add in AI machine learning, you get cognitive advisors who, who find correlations, who find insights that as human being you weren't looking for, but you get surprised. Cognitive advisors do that in an open loop. Later on, the next stage then is to go for closed loop where you allow the machine to run more. And this takes us on the journey towards autonomous. And 
it doesn't mean that we have put a, a specific point in time and, and, and have statements like the, the unmanned plant, but it is clear that we are on a journey to have more and more a higher degree of autonomous operations. And this horizontal integration is what is allowing that. Thank you, Michael. Um, I th that brings us to the close. Um, I want to thank uh, Danielle, my, my partner in crime and our CIO, and then Marcus, Suresh, and Michelle for a, for a very exciting, entertaining, and informative conversation. Thank you. Please welcome VP GM Connected Supply Chain, Taylor Smith. Thank you, thank you, and welcome everyone to the event. I'm pleased to be here today and excited to introduce three new or expanded offerings for Connected Supply Chain. And so in the next 25 minutes, I'm gonna walk through what is the promise of Honeywell's Connected Supply Chain, highlight those three products, but then really turn it over to the experts. We will be able to hear from my chief technology officer, as well as a partner that helps deploy these solutions to end customers, and then an end customer themselves. So what is connected supply chain? What are we trying to deliver here at Honeywell? And it's really around three core values. First is worker productivity. Labor is still one of the highest costs of operating a distribution center, and our solutions help make that workforce more productive, deliver higher quality activities. Second, is really around asset reliability, performance, and health. You heard from the industrial space. They're a little bit further ahead than distribution centers on their ability to optimize, but as warehouse automation has boomed over the last five or 10 years, now companies are turning to how to monitor those effectively, how to ensure that they don't have unplanned downtime that disrupts delivery of goods to the stores or to our homes now with the boom of e-commerce. And lastly, it's about supply chain visibility, particularly for those controlled industries where knowing where every specific product goes, if it's a controlled substance like tobacco or alcohol or pharmaceuticals. And for each of those, we have some exciting new offerings that we'll dive into right now. So first is Forge Performance Plus. We announced that last year in October, and we're off to a very exciting start with our customer base. Performance Plus really focuses on that worker productivity and asset uptime. And today we're announcing enhancements in three of the core modules. On the site performance side, we've gotten feedback that customers want the ability to have more streamlined reporting and flexible KPI reporting that meet their business needs. And so we're bringing that to market here, where we can actually look at more historical trends, but also user configurable KPI and dashboarding and reporting. Second, on workforce intelligence, we're empowering the workers to report incidences on the spot through their mobile device. So think of being able to walk up and down an aisle, immediately identify that there's a spill, a cleanup, or a hazard, and have that digitally transmitted back and actioned out. We're shortening times that typically take hours down to minutes. And lastly, asset performance, we're improving that productivity with integration to work order management systems, driving some machine learning, predictive maintenance alerts and analytics, and improving how we visualize some of the complex sortation and conveyor assets. But you probably don't wanna hear from me on that all the time, so let's actually hear from one of our customers and how they've been using the system. Gordon Food Service is the largest family-owned food service business in North America. We're in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Overall, from an outbound perspective, we ship out about 125,000 cases a day over five days a week on about 170 routes a day. The importance of maintenance can't be overstated. We're relying on automated systems to deliver groceries to our customers. It really is the backbone of the facility. Breakdowns cause downtime. Our goal is to try to be ahead of any sort of breakdown. With the Forge product, it's allowed us to take that a step further. 
Honeywell Forge has helped with recognizing where there's opportunities to either improve productivity and efficiency or prevent any sort of breakdowns with some of our machinery. Honeywell Forge gives you real-time trends to be able to see any issues from vibration to temperatures to acceleration. That is really the key to this product is that we're going to be able to do real-time predictive maintenance. Which ultimately helps us service the customer. One of our values as customer is King. You see that the results that we're kicking out and our ability to distribute so many cases through this distribution center with very little breakdowns. Honeywell Forge has empowered us to ensure that our system's running properly. That type of consistency has been very important and our customers feel that. I think a customer can always say, uh, in much better words than I can, how the system's used, the value that it brings, and actually be the proof point. The next offering and announcement that I'd like to make is a brand new offering. While it's based off of our years of experience of providing track and trace solutions for European tobacco and compliance initiatives, this is now focused on helping the Middle East, in particular the UAE, and all of the constituents in the pharmaceutical supply chain there, whether it's a manufacturer, distributor, dispenser, pharmacy, to adhere to some new regulations where you now need to report to a national repository at each of those stages what pharmaceutical products you're handling, who you sold them to, did they move locations in your facility, when were they finally dispensed to a patient. And so we've taken all of the building blocks that we have in providing these solutions to other industries, cloud-based offering, mobile applications, data integrations to back-end systems and repositories, web portals and APIs, to be able to provide a seamless solution for anywhere in that value chain for customers in the UAE. So very excited to be able to deliver that greater supply chain visibility in that region. And then lastly, where we'll focus time with the panel here, it's about our guided work solutions. And this is all about worker productivity, where we can see organizations drive 5, 10, even up to 30% productivity by moving to voice-directed work. And that's particularly in the warehouse operations space and inspection space of heavy equipment and machinery. But what we're most excited about to announce today are really two key enhancements. One is around our pick up and go speech recognition, which delivers reduced training and easier onboarding for employees. And then second is the connector, which can take a typical deployment time that may be in months, two to three months, down now to days or weeks based off of its low code, no code configuration capability. So many of you may not be aware that Honeywell is the leading provider of these type of voice automated systems and have been in the industry for the last few decades, but we continue to invest. We continue to drive enhancements, continue to bring value to our customers on an ongoing basis. And with that, we'll hear from some of them as I'd like to bring up Delbert Joseph, the Chief Technology Officer for Honeywell Connected Supply Chain, Joe Beydoun, the VP of Technology, from Lapari Foods, and Todd Greenwald, who is the president and GM for Heartland. Welcome, everyone. So maybe just starting off, we'll do a little bit of kind of background and set the field here. So Todd, uh, maybe help the audience understand the partner ecosystem that Honeywell has to deliver these solutions to the market. Like, what role does a partner play? Well, the right partner, um, ultimately, they should kind of complement and speed up the time to success in any kind of projects that someone's looking at getting involved with as a business. Um, someone like Heartland is focused on, um, you know, various technologies, um, focused specifically on, on supply chain areas like warehouse manufacturing and transportation logistics type businesses. Um, it's good to have someone that is aligned to what what industry you play in so so for someone like us you know we're looking for uh maybe what what your needs are but we also know what other other operations look like for for uh, a better better route to success 
um, you know, with with my team at Heartland, you know, we have a very deep um, level of technical knowledge of how the various solutions and systems work that we we work with our our good friends at Honeywell and our customers, and that's an important thing um, to make sure that you pick someone that has that. Um, we also spend a lot of time too um, focusing on not just all the technology that's available, but like we really want to get intimate with your operation to see uh, how your how your workflows look like, what your what you have challenges with, and where your workers might uh, uh, highlight something that you might not know just from walking around that floor, maybe on that warehouse distribution floor. Ultimately, it's about um, you know uh, uh, making sure the project is successful, but most important is as you kind of walk down that path, then who's going to help you? Um, deploy the system, stage it, and get this thing um, off the ground and running as quickly as possible so it can impact your business. And then most important, too, for what we found is having someone that can do ongoing support for you so you're not just kind of hanging with the bag of all the things of, of what we've got to so far at this point, uh, making sure that we're here for you every step of the way when you need us to to jump in. So uh, hopefully that kind of helps, uh, you know, look, look at... Um, uh, that for the customers that are online with us here. Yeah, so just, I mean, really the, the partner ecosystem of Honeywell is that last mile of, of delivery for the customers, right? Where you, you help implement, you know their business inside and out. Uh, I think it was maybe David that said it earlier. You take the 80% of our solution and really help kind of configure, integrate, and deploy for that last 20% for the customers. Like a Lapari Foods, not necessarily a customer of yours, but so Joe, how are you actually using the voice picking solution in your operations and the types of benefits that you've seen? Um, hey everyone, uh, Joe from LaPerry here. Uh, you know, our business is shipping cases. We ship over 200,000 cases a day. Um, we do it out of four facilities. We ship across the entire Midwest. Um, and uh, we've been using voice for so long, I almost forget all the benefits, but we use it for picking. And um, it really is the winning solution every time you're touching a case and, and moving it, um, unless you're doing it with uh, conveyors, of course. But uh, anytime a, a human being is involved and they're moving cases, voice is the winning technology. And we've proved it time and time again, um, whether we open a new facility uh, or, or we acquire a facility. As a matter of fact, I'll give you a quick story. Uh, we just uh, acquired a facility in Minnesota uh, that we use using RF guns, um, and their shift was eight and a half hours. Um, we converted 15 employees over to voice system, and we cut that shift down almost uh, 30% um, and, and improved on accuracy. So performance is really the, the key with voice. Um, I don't know how I can do it any other way at this point. Yeah, that's great. And there's, I guess, one of the examples. I said anywhere from 5 to 30%, and Joe's one that uh, hit the 30% mark there. So that's great. Now. I talked a little bit about what was coming out in these new releases, because you heard from Joe Delbert that he's been using it for many years, but we continue to invest, continue to advance the solution. So as our chief technology officer, I mean, maybe explain a little bit more of what's new in this latest release and, and why it's important. Yeah, in, the, in, in the latest release, we have two very, very critical um, additions to our um, feature set. One is our pick up and go. And one is our connector strategy and, and plug-in strategy. So um, and pick up and go is where we have our um, voice, in, our indirect voice um, capabilities, in which where, you know, before we had to like train a lot, it takes a lot of time. And then um, if, you, if you multiply it around 100 um, employees, it'll be, you know, I take half a day. Now you can just pick up and go, automatically, um, automatically recognize your voice, and and you are able to, to just take the device, speak to it, and it has some key capabilities. One is it can learn as you go about using it, and the second one is it has really key um, optimizations around noise. So think of a, a warehouse where you have a lot of devices, a lot of MHE, a lot of equipment, a lot of people walking. And you have a lot of noise, so so you might use your Siri, you might use your Alexa, and but that really works really well in a nice, quiet environment. With our technology, you can work in a in a very noisy um, environment. It's optimized, it's tuned, so you can just speak, and regardless of the noise level or the noise profile, it can understand what you're saying. And the second part is our connector strategy, 
And it's really around how we can make our partners like Todd move a lot faster. Um, we have we made some significant changes to how our software works so that you could have all of this plugins. So you know, before any little change, you have to like rebuild the whole thing. Now we can just focus on very key parts of your workflow, parts of your host integration, and you could just build that and then deploy it within our um, connector capability. And, uh, and, that, and that reduces work by, from, as you said, from months to like really to, um, to weeks. So uh, it's key capabilities that we have um, um, delivered in the latest release. Along with that, when you look at how, you know, for, you know, from a workflow perspective, where a, a lot of different key small pieces of a workflow, our customer changes, and they have to go back and reimagine the whole thing. Right now, we can make those changes really, really quickly, put in our new plugins, new hosts like WMSs, ERPs, and with our speech technology, reduce that whole, okay, you know, sign job check to actually having workers use our solution really, really quickly. So from a speed to market, it's, 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 it's like really key for us. Great, yeah. So let's focus on that speech recognition because it is a, a shift where historically we were 100% focused on highest accuracy as possible, yeah. which as you mentioned, required some training when, when a new employee started at, at their first shift of, of their first day. Uh, maybe Joe, I think your company originally started with that, which we called kind of speaker dependent that required training. You've now adopted some of this newer technology that we call pick up and go. Any insights that you can provide there as far as adoption and benefit that you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. We, we really truly love pick up and go. Um, it, it has been a lifesaver, uh, especially if you think of, uh, you know, the, the employee crisis that we had during COVID and we were just hiring people um, just turnover rates over 300,000, just bringing in new employees all the time, uh, switching to pick up and go just for the trainees, uh, you know, instead of just doing voice templates for people that are working for you for three or four days and then quitting. Um, switching that all to, to pick up and go, just phenomenal. Um, and then what I did was adopt it over to uh, acquisition sites. So when we acquired a company and we put in voice technology in, we switched it all to pick up and go. As a matter of fact, I have a site that hasn't gone back. They just kept kept up with pick up and go. Uh, the one of the best things about pick up and go, you can show up to work. Uh, you can be sick, you can be tired, or you could have just had like tons of caffeine that day. It still understands you. You don't have to redo any templates or repeat words. Um, it, it's just a fantastic you know addition to the voice technology. That's I'll, that's I'll great. That. Yeah, go ahead. Don. I'll add to that. So one of the key things we added and um, and I just talked about is our adaptive ability. So. As you, as a worker comes in, it has a fit, it, you know, it has a baseline, and as they start using the solution, it starts to learn, and as they start going throughout the day, it learns the environment and it learns how they speak. So as you start going from, you know, from the, from the shipping area to the picking area to the, to all these different areas that have different types of equipment, so your noise changes, it adapts um, it dynamically and uh, and adjusts certain templates and properties to be able to to really be really accurate and that's you know one of our key patterns that we just got granted for for um, you know for Honeywell yeah and again that you keep hearing this 80 20 theme or maybe I'm trying to make too much of it but again we're out of the box we deliver some sort of great performance yeah. but through machine learning through our technology we're able to adapt to each unique environment which Joe's distribution centers are probably different from one another, but very different than, than other customers. Uh, so on the connector front, we talked about how that is able to really speed the time of deployment, reduce the time to, to money for customer, time to return for customers. But Todd, as a partner, like what does that more simplistic connector mean for you and what you're able to do now for your end customers? Well, I wouldn't be lying if I didn't say it was extremely exciting that you guys have uh, got to this point with the connectors because um, it has been a challenge. I'll be I'll be honest um, over the years of trying to use voice um, and make it work with what the need is. Um, it it has really reduced the technical skill level needed. Um, I don't want to say no code, but uh, there's almost a low code approach to making um, the workflows and the um, the the plugins um, just 
easier to put together and and lay out for what the business needs are. Um, it's sim- it's also like simplify the level of um, training and the experience um, to deploy Honeywell Voice Solutions um, as a partner, um, which is the most important thing with that is really it comes down to we want to get this solution going. The, the, if the business is recognized already that we're serving, hey, this could actually benefit um, our organization by going to voice. We want to get it going and let's try it out and see where it's working well, um, what tweaks we can make um, to make it even better. And the key thing is we don't want to be too worried about um, intricate coding and making it and making those X's and O's all aligned so so the op, the uh, the solution works well. So, you know, it, you know, really enabling that more efficient customer deployment, that's key. We want to make that, we want to get that going as soon as possible. Um, but the other part too is just, you know, simple, simplifying the training and development of our resources, um, really enabling our team to, to shine um, for, for the business that we serve. And then, um, you know, it's just it's just created a much more uh, streamlined process, I think, at the end of the day um, to to manage and, and leverage the connector that Honeywell has developed, Taylor. So it's it's very exciting to a partner like us. I know I know um, as a uh, uh, partner in the community and I work side by side with many of the other partners and in, in some of the engagements that we work with Honeywell on. Um, I know a number of the partners are really excited about the, the new connector that, that you guys have put together. Great. Thanks, Todd. And I, I didn't really put it together until I heard you and Joe both talk, but both features are really about reducing that training and onboarding time, whether it's the user and operator themselves on the voice system or the companies that are implementing it, whether Honeywell, our partner, or an end customer is deploying the system themselves, kind of both are helping alleviate and reduce that technical knowledge, burden, and kind of onboarding time that's required. So let's turn the page looking ahead, Delbert, here. And we've talked about what's exciting and coming now, but look to the future. I mean, what new features and capabilities are, are we working on behind the scenes here? Yeah, we're working on, um, so as you look at the landscape of our solutions, um, how, and how do you take all those pieces together and make sure we have an outcome, right? Um, so right now, we're looking at a, a lot of integrations with all our solutions um, across Honeywell, um, how we use voice in other areas. So we are investing in expanding our integration within, within Honeywell itself and our partner um, solutions. We're looking at analytics, um, not just analytics like dashboards or you know, pretty graphs, but really insights. How do you look at, you know, from a workflow to all of the data that we collect from the voice, how they how accurate it, it is, um, how we use that to more or less retrain our models, um, how we use that to kind of do some of the recognitions and um, recommendations that our, our customers are asking for. So as they go through all of the workflow throughout the day, as we look at all of the worker performance, as we look at how they use the device themselves, how can we do then recommend um, what, how, they, you know, how they can use that data to improve their you know, efficiency of their business. So these are the two areas, more areas that we're looking at. One is around analytics, and, and the other one is really around the integration, more from an end-to-end -end horizontal um, perspective. Great. And this could be a, a dangerous one, but last question here. So I guess turning it over to you, Joe, I mean, what trends do you see in your worker productivity or areas of focus and that you'd like to see Honeywell continue to invest in and solve problems? Um, I, I really strongly feel that that vision um, and visual AI is, is probably the next step, um, you know, and it could be accessorized with voice. Um, uh, just get in, um, you know, getting cameras onto this equipment, uh, you know, is, is the future. I think uh, we want cameras uh, not to watch the employees, but kind of see what they're doing. Uh, and then just, uh, you know, like Delbert said, I just want to improve what they're doing by just watching them through an AI model. And, and maybe I can do cycle count cycle counting, count the boxes, get more accurate on what they're doing, uh, improve their productivity just by seeing what's slowing them down. Um, safety technology, there's, there's a lot we can do with that, um, you know, that AI and, and just exactly what uh, was mentioned. We don't need dashboards. We need that data to do something actionable for us almost automatically. Great. 
Well, thanks, Joe, Todd, Delbert, for joining. Uh, really insightful. And the nice thing about Honeywell Connected Enterprise and Forge are the tremendous set of assets that we have across all of our businesses, which we have a, a pretty substantial video analytics group and capabilities as well. So we'll look at following up on that. But thank you all, and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you all. We will now take a 10 minute break. Thank you.
Please make your way to your seats. Our program will begin shortly. Please welcome VP, GM, Emissions Management, Ravi Srinivasan. Hey, uh, welcome back uh, to this break. And I, I'm really excited to be here talking about our sustainability solutions and also talking about the new product launches uh, for, for this session today. Uh, as you all know, I think uh, the great presentation early, early today talking about sustainability and the need for sustainability. As we all know, it's on top of the mind for all various CEOs and the corporates of the world. So today, a uh, session, I'm going to have it in three, uh, in three uh, topics. First and foremost, I want to give you a quick overview what are sustainability solutions about and also talking about the new product launches. That's not just only the software, but also the hardware sensors part of it as well. The second part, I'll be joined uh, by experts for a panel discussion talking about the challenges and what are the insights they would like to share with us. The third part, which is the really exciting one, is going to be a demo of our sustainability software along with our cameras and the sensors uh, uh, to show how we are actually uh, tracking the emissions and how we are proactively mitigating the emissions as well. Uh, there's been a tremendous pressure uh, you know, from the various regulators, customers, and stakeholders and also there's a lot of demand for the low carbon product footprint. So this has made a lot of our CEOs to make a commitment towards a net zero or carbon neutrality over a period of time. Having said that, uh, this journey is not a simple one, right? If it has been so simple, I would always say that people would do that in a year or two. And since uh, the net zero or carbon neutrality goals have been set over the next decade or two, uh, there, are, there has been, um, you know, that's, you need a transformational partner to help you in this journey. So to have this, Honeywell has developed a robust methodology in terms of a framework, how we actually take this forward. So we have it in four pillars uh, called the measure, monitor, report, and reduce. So what is important, you know, where, uh, in the, traditionally, uh, the way the industry has been approaching is doing a lot of estimations and spreadsheet calculations. If you can't measure in real time, there's very little chance that we can mitigate the emissions and actually achieve the goal that you're looking for. Having an accurate baseline of carbon emissions is very, very critical if you want to take the step forward. 
So the, to have that, you've got to have direct measurements of the emissions in real time. That's one. Second is to mitigate, there could be different ways and plans to get to the mitigation action. There are a lot of multiple pathways to get there. Using a marginal abatement cost curve, our system can help you to track the different methodologies to get to the destination, and one could be cost effective than the other. So it's always important to understand how we take this forward. The third part, which is very, very critical, is the report and the reduction part. The reduction comes in two forms. One is looking at the operational efficiencies in the plant. Others looking at the energy transitions and the new process technologies that we see. On, with respect to the energy efficiency, which I call it the low-hanging fruits, because these are all generally NP NPV positive in the plant, if you look at the, uh, in the graph that I have on the screen, if you look from the left to right, the first and foremost is proactive leak detection repair. Currently, the mechanism that most of the companies follow is using the sniffers and all the stuff. Using a direct measurement, ability to proactively leak, identify for the leaks, and, and fixing the leaks helps to reduce the emissions a great way. The second part comes with the operational efficiency, having energy efficiency programs such as advanced process control optimization, also using asset performance management to improve the efficiency of the assets. So all the assets, you know, they consume energy, lower the energy consumption, has got direct impact to emissions. As you move to the right, there are various new technologies, be it carbon capture, be it green hydrogen, or eco-finding, for example, or the sustainable aviation fuel. All these things have got very, very positive impact in terms of impacting your carbon emissions. And uh, with Honeywell, I think what is great about it is that we not only have the technology, we also have the process experience, the expertise. Combined with that, we are uniquely positioned to be that transformational partner. We can actually help you in the journey towards achieving the sustainable outcomes for your organization. With the, I'm going to take a quick look at the new product that is being launched uh, today. Uh, in the last fall, uh, uh, fall, we launched the scope and emission for industrial, primarily focused on the upstream. Having said that, over the last few months, we expanded the offerings to cover other verticals such as the downstream chemicals and so on and so forth. Also, having said that, we also introduced, uh, happy to announce, the scope to emissions, which is based on market and the location for the industrial segment. This is very, very critical. This gives you a complete overwhelming uh, 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 solution around the scope one and scope to four industrials. The four sustainability emissions management for sustainability plus emissions management software allows you to do a real-time measurement, accurately quantify the emissions, also provide proactive insights, and also provide industry agnostic visualization that helps you to scale across the enterprise. The whole software starts at the, uh, at the emission source level. It helps you to uh, it helps you to aggregate at the plant and the site level, and also at the enterprise level. Along with this launch today, we also have very thrilled to announce the launch of Vesitilis Signal Scout real-time methane emissions detection system. So this sensor, what we are doing here is that its ability to detect leaks in real time and also quantify the leaks, that actually helps you to do proactive remediation action in the plant. So the whole software combined with the Rebellion gas clouding imaging cameras along with the energy efficiency solutions and also the other uh, technologies that Honeywell has, we are actually uniquely positioned to be a transformational partner. We can help you to take you from where you are today over the next uh, decade or two to a net zero or a carbon neutrality, the goals that you might have set. So uh, with that, I'm going to shift my gears into, uh, into the panel, panel discussion. And I'm going to have invite Deanna and Harry Brandnell uh, from Ineos Innovin, who is joining me from U United Kingdom. Harry, how are you there? Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Hey, Harry, uh, hey, uh, good to see you here again. Uh, Harry, can, can you just please introduce yourself? Hi there, Ravi. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Harry Brentnell, uh, and I'm a sustainability specialist at Ineos Innovin. Um, we're the largest European chloralkali uh, manufacturer, um, and I coordinate our roadmaps to meet both our 2030 and 2050 um, carbon neutrality goals. Okay. Hey, Adina, can you introduce yourself? Let Hi, me get my... Voice of customer for their sustainability offerings, a business development leader. Um, my background has been in the energy utility business. I ran 
uh, a gas infrastructure in Southern California for two utilities, San Diego Gas Electric and SoCal Gas, and I ran their environmental services and policy departments. Before I left, I was their sustainability leader to help them decarbonize and develop the decarbonization solutions for their company. Thank you. Good to have you both, Harry and Deanna, here. Hey, Harry, I, I got a few questions here. And uh, just first and foremost, you know, as more and more manufacturers are being driven to solve the problems on how they can reduce a carbon footprint while remaining profitable, what strategy do you see being deployed to enable to achieve their goals? I think um, there's sort of two phases to this. I think the first phase is sort of where we layer projects together to maximize our um, carbon um, uh, reduce carbon offerings in, in our in products in sort of smaller smaller offerings and use these to test our um, our technologies um, to, to 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 test out the implementation for them and then using these as the springboard to the the wider um, larger decarbonization of our whole sort of product portfolio so it's like very much a two-stage process Ravi where we're where we're sort of testing things and seeing how they work at a smaller scale and then leveraging that um, in that um, knowledge and experience we've gained to to, to get the larger um, fruit in the future okay you're trying to uh, kind of balance between the short term versus the long term exactly awesome exactly. thank you uh, do you know what's a view on accurate emission mode of emissions emission reduction considering the the history that we've been doing on a lot of estimations so um, accurate measurement links to credibility and transparency that we're going to need in this particular space um, you have to have credible emission profiles and transparency in those profiles in order for your stakeholders to believe that you're not greenwashing, that you're really reducing um, to those targets that you've, you've um, committed to, things like that. And part of that is to do accurate measurement. And what is accurate measurement? Typically, it means that you have representative um, data of your emission profile. And how do you get representative data? you measure it more often. And more samples typically reduces that uncertainty of what, what's happening at your facility. And for us, you know, Sustainability Plus at our emission management suite, we have continuous monitoring to get that sampling. We have the movie, not the photograph. We have the ability to go beyond the snapshot um, testing and sampling of what's happening today to get the full picture of what's happening in your facilities and the emission profile linked to your process so that you can drive the reductions that you need because most of the emissions that are coming out of your operations relate to your process and the sustainability digital platform and the emission management suite will support helping you link and diagnose what's the root causes of your emissions so that you could drive those re reductions effectively. Well, thank you. And also the direct measurement is going to help us well. In That's right. Of, okay, awesome. Harry, uh, just switching to you, what would you say are the biggest challenge to embed, embed more operational sustainable solutions in a business? I think as with a lot of big um, change management things, uh, where, we're, where we're looking for big changes, the, um, the managing that change is critical and, and making sure we bring everybody along on the journey with us. Um, in the past, the focus hasn't maybe been on sustainability as it should have been. Um, and as, as we move on our journey um, to net, uh, 2030 and 2050 goals, it's bringing people along on the shop floor um, and making sure that they're both optimizing what they're doing and making sure we're not um, our operational procedures are followed and optimized as far as we can, but also as we utilize our new technologies and deploy them throughout our assets, using their um, support to make sure that we get the full um, savings, the carbon savings and circular savings out of the technology that we're developing and implementing um, throughout Innovin. Uh, thanks, Shuri. I think that also reminds me of one thing. You know, in the past few decades ago, safety was kind of uh, an add-on that came in to be safe, but safety became part and parcel of the culture. The way I'm seeing in, talk, in a lot of discussion with the customer, sustainability will eventually get there. It is no longer be seen as a cost. It will be part and parcel of the DNA of the organization to create a more sustainable future. 
So, Diana, uh, in respect to what are the effective policy measures and regulations that can be implemented at national and international levels, and also if we could add to add all the new regulations that are coming to play, like IRA, CBAM, and all this stuff, can you just uh, give a little There's bit There's a of lot insight? to that, yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, key policies um, to be effective in, in reducing emissions have to have optionality and flexibility for a customer and for businesses in general. Optionality, we don't have all the answers today, so optionality is needed to, to figure out if something doesn't work, you need to be p able to pivot quickly to, to, you need to have options to be able to, to get to those emission reductions. So optionality is a, a key theme that, that policies need to have and flexibility. Flexibility in when you have to repair something, when you have to fix something, you know, flexibility in terms of the monitoring technologies. There's a, there's a fixation around detection efficiency, you know, around monitoring de de technologies where they could go down to, let's say, parts per billion to measure methane in the atmosphere. Well, the background is at parts per million, you know, so what use is it that your detection is lower than the background? So those are some of the issues that have to be um, worked out, and if policies can be more flexible to enable to focus on the reduction target, what you're trying to achieve, instead of being prescriptive, that will really help innovate in this space and help get emission reductions quicker. Okay, and can you just highlight a little bit on the IRA and the CBAM? Yeah, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, I, I have two themes here, carrots and sticks. The Inflation Reduction Act, is, which recently passed last year in 2022, and it has some carrots and sticks around emission reduction and um, especially around um, carbon capture and sequestration solutions and hydrogen and also around a stick um, for methane and for those companies that are in the oil and gas value chain, um, there, there's a stick that if you are exceeding certain thresholds around your production, for example, so much emissions per unit of production, then you will be charged potentially for um, the emissions above or the methane above that threshold. It could be fairly significant, um, $900 starting in uh, 2024, all the way up to $1,500 a metric ton of methane exceeding that threshold in the 2026 plus timeframes. So there's carrots and sticks. There's a great carbon uh, capture sequestration um, tax credit that just got moved from my, around $50 a metric ton to up to uh, $85, which is going to create some new opportunities to help with um, carbon capture and sequestration projects. And then on the hydrogen front, they were able to put in some production tax credits depending on how low the carbon <laughs> intensity of your hydrogen um, production is, you can get more tax credits or more incentives around that. On the European front, they just recently implemented what's called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. That mechanism um, has six products that they are going to basically putting a carbon tax on. Six products are cement, fertilizer, iron and steel, electricity, and I um, can't remember the other ones, but the idea behind all of those six products, there's one theme behind all those six products. They use natural gas. They use natural gas to make. So our system, sustainability plus emission suite, will help you get the embedded carbon, the carbon intensity of that natural gas that's going into those products. And make sure you have that fully, fully um, accounted for so that you can basically see whether or not those products that are using your, your, your supply of natural gas meet the thresholds that the European are going to be putting that carbon tax on. So that's going to be really helpful. Thank you, Diana. I think we're running a little late, so we've got a little bullet in the phone. So uh, uh, just, Harry, what are your final thoughts? Any comments from your side, Harry, before we switch to the em uh, emissions uh, demo? I think it's a bit of an exciting time to be in sort of sustainability, Ravi. I think ultimately this is like our opportunity to get a competitive edge. That's how we see it in Enios Innovin. Um, and I think that seeing it like that means that it, there's, uh, there's opportunities to do well. It's not just um, uh, a, a stick, as Diana was saying. It, there, there's carrots as well in sort of doing better from the uh, at the bottom line. Awesome. Thank you, Harry. And uh, what we'll do is that we'll shift to the demo. Uh, can we play the demo, please? 
Hi, my name is Eric Van Gemeren. I have the good fortune of serving as the Chief Technology Officer for Honeywell Process Solutions. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Control, it is in the best interest of humankind to figure out how to limit the global warming of our planet to no more than one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. And in response to that, governments and regulatory agencies around the world have launched a series of legislative moves and new regulations to limit the emission of greenhouse gases that have the potential to warm the planet. And top of the list on those gases is methane, with more than 30 times the ozone depleting potential of carbon dioxide, it is a clear and present danger to our environment. Now, this poses CEOs and corporate boards with some interesting challenges. Two big issues, number one, how do I develop a long-term plan that meets the needs of our shareholders, the needs of our environment, and the needs of our customer to get to carbon neutrality? But how also do I meet the near-term requirements to limit the financial penalties that have to be paid for greenhouse gas emissions today? And this requires a complex solution that solves two important problems. First, how do I empirically quantify what my emissions are? And second, how do I associate those emissions with my actual business processes to understand what I am doing and how it is creating those emissions in the first place? Without those solutions, it's very difficult to make a difference. But this is where Honeywell's end-to-end -end solution really makes a difference. Now, in today's technology, we've been limited in our ability to get direct quantification and associate it with process emissions for two big reasons. Today, the challenge of doing this in an empirical way relies on two common technologies, methane sensors and infrared cameras. Now, methane sensors are very common, but they're challenged by the fact that they don't offer you directionality. They can't tell you where the gas is coming from. As a result, in order to figure out how to associate those emissions with your process, we often resort to very manual, labor-intensive, route-based methods where we actually walk around with a sniffer following piping runs and sniff every flange and every valve and every mechanical seal looking for the sources of emissions. This is incredibly costly, is incredibly time-consuming, and as a result, most end users can't afford to do this more than a quarterly basis, sometimes even only an annual basis. Honeywell has solved this problem with the development and introduction of our new Signal Scout offering. Now, Signal Scout builds on the idea of a methane sensor, but adds some really great innovations. First, using ultra-low-powered microelectronics, we can make this entire device in an intrinsically safe format that can be installed directly on process equipment all throughout the space. Second, using computational fluid dynamics and other analytic techniques, we can create a swarm of these sensors that are stationary throughout the plant, and the software translates their readings to geolocate both the quantity of the leak as well as the location of the leak. And this dramatically reduces the amount of effort required to get fact-based quantification of methane emissions, but it also allows you to get real-time emissions information. And this, we believe, is a game changer for the industry. But also according to the re readily available industry standards, we need two methods of quantification. And this is where many customers fall back on the other most common methodology, which is infrared cameras. Now, infrared cameras detect temperature differences between gases and their background, and they can do it with a high degree of accuracy. But here again, they have a real practical limitation. It is impossible for an infrared camera to actually identify what type of gas is being emitted, as well as to accurately quantify concentrations in a plume. Infrared cameras also have the problem that they can become easily obscured by atmospheric debris like dust or smoke or particles in the air. And this really limits the practical deployment of infrared technology. Here again, Honeywell has leveraged innovation to solve this problem. While we're using an infrared camera, very much like the one above my head here today, our Rebellion camera exploits the laws of quantum mechanics to speciate gases. The principle is pretty straightforward. These gases, when they're in the atmosphere, absorb atmospheric radiation. 
and they have to re-radiate that energy, but according to the laws of quantum mechanics, they can only do it at very, very specific electromagnetic bandwidths. Our camera uses this as a fingerprint to uniquely speciate the specific molecule that's in the air. And we do this by looking across multiple different spectrums that have been tuned specifically to detect the gases that we're looking for. We combine all of this data on a frame-by-frame -frame basis and use artificial intelligence to be able to identify the specific type of molecule that's in the air, as well as measure quantity, concentration, as well as model plume dynamics. This is actually really easily demonstrated. If I start with a simple can of compressed air, just like you can find anywhere, and you can see it's a colorless, odorless gas that is virtually impossible to detect with the naked eye. Now, this particular type of compressed gas uses a propellant known as difluoroethane. And if I now spray this in the air, not only does Rebellion accurately identify the substance, but our algorithm uniquely identifies that that is difluoroethane that's present, and we can actually give you real-time quantification of the concentration of the molecule in the cloud. This, again, allows us to uniquely identify the source of emissions and where it's coming from. But how do we bring all this together in a true end-to-end -end solution that's easy to use? This is where Forge Sustainability Plus comes in. Forge Sustainability Plus takes real-time empirical quantification data from devices such as Signal Scout and Rebellion, as well as factor-based calculations across all other sources of emissions, and brings it together in a simple, easy-to-use interface. In this example here, you can see how our CEO or corporate sustainability officer would be able to identify and understand not only what our current emissions are, but the progress that we're making towards our commitment for carbon neutrality. But let's drill in and see a little bit more details. If we now drill into the dashboard underneath, we can begin to see how our emissions vary on a site-by-site -site basis or a geographical basis. In this case, we can see what not only our instantaneous emissions are, but our scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. We can also see how our emissions intensity has been varying with time. And we can see that while overall we're on track and within our permitted limits, we can also see that we've got a couple of sites that are concerning and somewhat problematic. So let's now see what happens if we can drill in and use the tool to understand better where our opportunities are. Let's take a closer look at Beaumont, Texas. Drilling into Beaumont, we can now see how the emissions from that specific operation stack up from both scope one, scope two, and scope three. And we can see how those emissions break down by the source, combustion, flaring, process venting, et cetera. But we are going to need more information to figure out how to associate it with its process. So now let's dig a little deeper again and click on View Details. In this next screen, you can see the most important observation, which is process emissions are process dependent. And unless we can identify how they vary with the decisions we make on operating our plant, we don't understand what decisions we need to make differently to change the outcome. Here, I can associate the amount and intensity of emissions with my day-to-day -day production, and knowing what's happening in the plant, I can then connect that back to the process decisions I made. So let's take a closer look at our scope one emissions and drill down inside them a little bit more. Now here again, we can see the breakout between combustion, flaring, and venting, and for the purposes of this conversation, let's drill into fugitive emissions and see what's happening inside fugitive emissions. Here we can see fugitive emissions, and if we look at the details, we can see that in this particular case, storage tank area 101 in the Beaumont site has got a problem, is exceeding its permitted limits, and is outside its normal parameters. We can now use FORGE to begin to interrogate back to the direct quantification sources to figure out what we can do about it. So let's drill into tank area number one in a little bit more detail. Now you can see how our Rebellion and Signal Scout have been seamlessly integrated with Forge Sustainability Plus and physically superimposed on the actual site. In this interface, the hexagonal indicators actually show where these little devices are physically located throughout the plant. And again, they're static, they're stationary, they don't move. However, you can see how we have identified two leak sources that the Signal Scout has identified based on the model that we've created. 
Let's take a closer look at Beaumont leak number one. In this particular site, you can see how we have detected a fugitive emissions leak in the area of the handling equipment, and we have quantified that leak both based on what the Signal Scout tells us, as well as the leak information coming from our Rebellion camera on a live basis. Just like the demonstration that we showed earlier, we can physically visualize the process emissions, so not only do we know where the emissions are coming from, but we can associate it back with the actual business process that created those leaks in the first place. And this is where Honeywell really makes a difference. This technology is not only unique to Honeywell, but it's the only end-to-end -end solution available in the industry today that connects the fugitive emissions and other process emissions from a plant back to the business decisions on how they operate their processes, and that uniquely gives them insights on how to mitigate those leaks and actually develop further steps along their path to a true net zero future. Hopefully this short demonstration gives you a better idea of how Honeywell is leveraging next generation technology to solve real world business problems today, all while saving the planet. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, and looking forward to more interaction, and also looking forward for new releases as we move forward uh, during the rest of the year. Thank you. Please welcome VP GM Cyber Innovation, Michael Ruiz. So um, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, my first uh, time at Honeywell Connect uh, and i um, really excited about all the different uh, innovations uh, that we've seen. Uh, joining me here in a few minutes will be Dimple Shaw uh, and we'll be talking a little bit about uh, global, um, global technology, data policy and cybersecurity. <clears throat> As we think about where the uh, market is going, So as we think about the trends in cybersecurity, there are really three kind of trends that are driving uh, the space. Uh, first is the increase in threats uh, in, in general, the environment of, uh, the environment of threats. Uh, those really break down into two categories. We can think of them as nation state actors that are uh, trying to position themselves in a, in a very complex geopolitical uh, world that we're living in right now. Um, but also there's uh, cyber crime that, that still uh, is a problem. When we start to look at ransomware attacks, um, the monetization of cyber threat continues to be a problem. Uh, a recent report showed that 86% of uh, those companies that are attacked by ransomware will end up paying the ransom, um, and, and that creates additional problems and more uh, problems in, uh, in the industry. These, uh, these kinds of challenges around, um, around the, um, the kinds of threats or the increase in threats uh, are really driving um, a, a new viewpoint on or, or extra, um, um, extra insights into what we're thinking, how we think about the problem. Um, the shifting, um, the, the cybersecurity controls are now shifting into the C-suite. Um, we're more interested at the board level as to what, how do we monitor, how do we think about these uh, threats in a more holistic way? How do we think about our security posture uh, and the way that we think about these threats? So no longer within OT Cyber are we just thinking about the plant level and how we protect the one plant, but really it's how do we look at the aggregate of all of the plants and all of the devices and assets that we have in our organization to really think about that posture Posture, not only with IT but OT combined in a, into one view. That's another major uh, ma another major uh, trend that's going on, and and then we're also seeing a very uh, a, a significant change in the regulatory uh, space um, with all of the threats that are out there uh, and potential disruptions into uh, supply chains and other uh, and other things of that sort. Uh, more and more regulators are are looking into that space, whether it's the uh, national national policies around. Uh, executive orders and, um, and, and the uh, national cyber uh, strategy, uh, or whether it's things like SEC and FDA, or whether it's international policies that we're seeing, uh, that's creating a more complex environment. And so these three things are driving the way that we think about um, our, um, our solutions uh, within, Forge, uh, within Forge. Our Cybersecurity Plus solution um, is founded on this idea of being able to drive those insights. So, so why do we, why trust Honeywell? Why trust Forge with our cyber, with OT cybersecurity? 
Well, one is our experience. Uh, we've been in this industry for over 20 years, uh, providing cybersecurity uh, from the very beginning um, when, this became, when this became an issue and became in the conscious of, of our clients. Um, but also because of innovation. Um, if you, you know, today, this morning, I just saw uh, that uh, BCG has um, found, um, has, put, has put Honeywell on the top 50 list of most innovative uh, companies. Uh, that innovation, you saw some of that innovation in our sustainability, you've seen it in our Performance Plus, uh, but we're also bringing that innovation to cybersecurity. We're taking the legacy uh, cybersecurity products that we have today, and we're reimagining them in order to be able to really respond to an increasing threat environment, to really be able to respond to the way that we think about cybersecurity uh, most hol more holistically uh, and really bridge that gap between the IT and the OT environment. Uh, but we have to be able to do that in the construct of, of understanding uh, this complex uh, uh, governance environment that we live in, all of these regulatory uh, constraints that are coming up and, and regulatory opportunities that, that are there in order to help protect our supply chains. Uh, so with that, I'm going to invite Dimple Shaw to join me up here on stage and we're going to uh, talk a little bit about um, the governing, uh, governance and policy. Dimple. Sorry, can you go back a slide? So Dimple, uh, thanks for joining me up here. Um, as we think about um, policy, I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey that got you to become the policy expert that you are today. Thanks so much for having me here. Uh, like you, this is my first Connect, and I really appreciate the opportunity to join all of you here. And uh, well, uh, for your awareness, this is my first time in private sector. I joined Honeywell two years ago after 16 years in government. I started out my journey, I guess, in the policy lanes, originally as a prosecutor post 9-11, handling terrorism charges on behalf of the newly formed Department of Homeland Security and uh, the Department of Justice. However, you know, 16 years later, the nature of the threats changed. I went into the Department of Homeland Security with a terrorism background, came out with cybersecurity. Um, essentially, I had executed CISA's international strategy. I was the Assistant Secretary of International Affairs in my last role and also Deputy General Counsel at the Department of Homeland Security. So um, I I did largely items in the Homeland Security space, but also did six years on Capitol Hill, all in national security. So uh, with the nature, nature of the changing threats we face, you know, if you think about September 11th and what happened, um, if they had cybersecurity capabilities, would they ever have to fraudulently come into our country? Would they have to gain the aviation system? No, they could have just hacked the grid to begin with, right? So everything's changed, and uh, with that, governments are really energized, Michael, uh, with regard to OT in this time and space, operational technology. Five years ago, lawmakers didn't even understand OT. They were really focused on IT, ransomware, um, you know, other cyber attacks, and, and system availability, but that's changed. Yeah, no, that's really, really important. Um, this asymmetric space that we live in uh, really encourages nation state actors and, uh, and cyber criminals to think about the world in a very different way. Um, how, how, are, um, uh, how are, are, are increasing cyber threats really driving regulations? What are you seeing? Well, I think we have to you know, gauge this first uh, in light of world events. We've had uh, major cybersecurity attacks and ransomware attacks impacting operational technology. I would start with the Colonial Pipeline incident and then look to the JBS meatpacking hacking incident, and then also turn to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where critical infrastructure was indeed under attack. And so now we have a situation where governments really want to focus on protecting and defending critical infrastructure and, and are launching various policies that impact cyber posture of various critical infrastructure sectors. So let's dig into that a little bit. So what, what policies are you seeing? What are, what's being proposed? Um, how's that change in the landscape? Yeah, I mean, there's a series of buckets. I'll just highlight trends and we can, we can talk a little bit. But one of the main proposals we've seen globally is cyber incident reporting. Governments want more information on the incidents that critical infrastructure owners and operators are facing. So they want them to report the incident within a set amount of time, and they want the critical infrastructure owners and operators to provide details, i.e. they will set the parameters of what the report is, and therefore various, various sectors actually have to improve their cybersecurity posture so they can re respond to these requests, be in compliance with the regulatory bodies, and also mitigate and ameliorate taxes themselves. So when you think about this regionally, what regions are driving um, the biggest changes in 
uh, in cybersecurity. Yeah, so, you know, we have a series of ideas kind of being proposed in the trends. We have, you know, incident reporting. We have certification regimes for IoT and OT devices. We have designations to critical infrastructure and even national security strategies. And some people think national security strategies are just a statement of policy. They are but a lot of times they set their roadmap to what regulations are coming. So, you know, it, regions that are leading, we've seen a lot of activity, of course, coming out of the EU, uh, rising up from uh, the newly established CISA, uh, Cyber Security Infrastructure Security Agency, um, which was established about two years ago. We see a lot of activity in the EU um, as they also look to identify their critical infrastructure. They did, um, a piece of legislation uh, called NIS, um, and they fo they're following on right now with NIS 2, which is also an incident reporting regime and a certification regime. And we've seen a lot of activity, um, interestingly, um, in Southeast Asia, coming out of Singapore, where they actually have a very structured body, uh, much like CISA, and they have a very clear a governing body with their um, Cybersecurity Act. Excellent. Uh, how are these regulations impacting companies? and and and? How are we thinking about those? Well, you know, there's there's a lot of work to do with companies as there's a, there's a responsibility now being placed on companies to actually work with government. They talk about public-private partnership um, quite a bit, but really work with government to provide information on cybersecurity threats and threat actors and the vectors that they're seeing and also how they're ameliorating or mediating attacks so government can have an idea of what needs to be done and set forth best practices and holistically bring entire sectors forward. Excellent. So, you know, as, as we've seen here at Honeywell, you know, companies are going to be, you know, engaging with governments, influencing what is needed because we actually have the technology. Government doesn't have the technology. The government doesn't have the capabilities. So we have to, you know, work with government to make sure that they have the best information in order to come up with the best policies. And then companies later will also have to comply across their corporate enterprise with whatever's being proposed. Well, that's uh, that's uh, that's amazing. It sounds like really a, a complicated landscape. Um, when when you think about these um, uh, policies, uh, what are you seeing internationally? What what are the difference uh, kind of nationally versus internationally that we're seeing? You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I'd say in the U.S. there's a hotbed of activity, but it's less prescriptive because of the public-private partnership and the U.S. having a lot of the companies that have the capabilities to mitigate and ameliorate attacks. So you're seeing you know, more and more regulation, but it's coming up through partnership and originally starts out as voluntary and then becomes more prescriptive. On the flip side, for example, in the EU, we're seeing more prescriptive approaches with less public-private partnership coming down, indicating, you know, do these 15 things. If you do these 15 things, you're in compliant without necessarily having that back and forth with industry, which is all the more reason why we have to stay ahead of the trends. Well, that's amazing. Let me uh, let's move into um, you know this um, some of the the numbers here, some of the stats. When we think about cybersecurity incidents and, and what's driving some of these policies, uh, today a, a data breach can cost um, you know our uh, industrial um, uh, organizations up to four million dollars per. Uh, one of the things that was a very stark comparison for me when I was thinking about. Um, the IT versus OT environment. Uh, in the OT environment, we are often using um, a lot of manual processes to do assessments and, uh, and walking around still with uh, uh, clipboards and, and looking at devices and, and ensuring their level of patch and security. Um, so we, because of those kind of manual processes, we're seeing um, uh, intruders being on a network on, uh, for up to 270 days. Uh, this could lead up to $140 million worth of uh, damages, safety concerns, and, and, and other uh, negative uh, events for, uh, for organizations. So this kind of solution that we're uh, launching today, Cyber Insights, is uh, a mechanism that allows us to be able to, re to really remediate that problem, to, to change it. This is a mechanism that allows us to be able to do assessments in real time on site and to really be able to bring and highlight those kinds of threats and vulnerabilities uh, for, uh, to our clients so that they can go ahead and take action uh, and be able to limit those costs, be able to limit the uh, or, 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 or stop uh, intruders from being on their networks, really being able to um, uh, uh, improve the way that they can do their work. So when we think about that, we think about it from uh, really kind of a four major constructs. In order to be able to do this effectively, we have to be able to first integrate all of the data into one viewpoint that allows us to be able to uh, analyze and, and drive that. Then we need to be able to understand this data from a threat perspective. What are the threats that are in our space and what do we need to do about them? 
Uh, what are the vulnerabilities that may be leading to those threats? Um, but then also, how do I st stack up from a client, from a compliance perspective? Um, am I following all of the best practices? Am I following the policies of my organization? Uh, and what do I need to do uh, in order to, to uh, ensure that we have uh, all of the right things in place in order to drive the, the kind of change? Uh, so Cyber Insights allows us to do this. Now, we built this uh, technology uh, we built this technology using our centers of excellence. Uh, over 260 uh, client visits uh, that came into our spaces, uh, really sharing with us their major challenges, what they would like to see in a product and how, uh, and how that product uh, needs to, to be brought in. We, we did co-creation not only with our CISO, uh, Chase Carpenter, but also with other CISOs from other uh, companies. Uh, and the product that you're about to see was born out of our centers of excellence uh, and, and brought to you uh, by, uh, through our Cybersecurity Plus solution. So with that, let's take a look at how this all came about. Here in Duluth, Georgia, this is one of our centers of excellence. This is one of three. The other two are in Dubai and in Singapore. We are innovating new solutions that we can provide to our customers to help prevent cyber attacks. These centers of excellence have four major purposes. One, and most importantly, is to innovate. Look for new controls and protections that we can provide to our customers to help prevent cyber attacks. Another is training. We train our own technical people that deliver these solutions. There's over 400 around the globe, and that allows them to stay up on the latest threats and protections in the market. We also evaluate third-party solutions. There are plenty of commercial off-the-shelf best-in-class solutions, software applications in the market. IT has been doing this for many, many years, and we're adapting those technologies to the OT environment, which has a very uniqueness about it that you cannot just apply simple tools. You have to know the market. And most finally, it's to educate our customers. Help them come in here and see what's available. How can they help protect their systems against the cyber threats, which is doubling in the last year. So we meet our customers here on a daily basis and listen to their challenges and provide them the guidance on which direction they should go in terms of cybersecurity. Cyber Insights was the result of hundreds of customers coming to our centers of excellence. We were listening to their pain points and what they were looking for. They're worried about compliance. They're worried about threats. They're worried about vulnerabilities. All three of these things are integrated into Cyber Insights. It collects data from multiple sources and it has a capability of analyzing those data. So make it simpler for our customers to visualize their cybersecurity risks. They could also see their current posture of their cybersecurity readiness in terms of industry compliance. We also provide the professional service to help deploy very quickly. And finally, we can also help customers fine tune the product to their site specific needs. The major advantage of aligning with Honeywell as your cyber partner is that we're constantly looking at the future, we're constantly evaluating the current threat and potential future threats, and so that we can figure out what kind of mitigating controls we need to be working on to help protect our customers against those potential threats. Every building has a story. They are a place to come together, receive care, dream big, and house our greatest innovations. They are an indelible part of our social fabric. Yet, as societies change, so does our idea of what a building can be. New uses, new requirements, new expectations. At Honeywell, we've been a part of the story of buildings for decades. And now, we're here to start the next chapter. Introducing Honeywell Forge for Buildings, an advanced approach to intelligent buildings designed for the stories of tomorrow. Combining software, hardware, and services, Honeywell Forge for Buildings helps deliver outcomes that matter to organizations of any size. Like helping to drive sustainability so buildings are a part of the carbon solution instead of a problem aid in mobilizing operational efficiency to improve asset and worker performance, foster occupant experience to bring well-being and comfort into our spaces, create resilience to rapidly respond to the unexpected and aim for uptime all the time. 
support safety and security, to keep places better protected and people better informed, and assist with managing compliance to help maintain business continuity. With Honeywell Technology Solutions in 10 million buildings worldwide and a global partner network, we know that intelligent buildings need an open, software-led, multi-asset approach that meets you anywhere on the journey. From ramping up a single site to digitalizing a global portfolio. With Honeywell Forge for Buildings, you can architect the next chapter. The only question is, what story do you want to tell? Please welcome VP GM Connected Buildings, Sadiq Syed, and VP CPO Connected Buildings, Manish Sharma. Hello, everyone. I'm, this is okay, yeah. You can hear me, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm excited to be here today. What a fantastic day it's been already with exciting product launches that me and my colleagues are walking you through. And he, I'm here with my partner in crime, Manish uh, Sharma, to walk you through what the future of connected buildings is. It's an exciting day for me and my colleagues across the globe uh, in connected buildings to launch the new path forward for, for the building's uh, domain. Uh, over the next few minutes, uh, we'll, we'll walk you through the exciting launches that are coming up and why we are doing this. Our customers have told us that we need a comprehensive set of offerings and solutions in the building's domain. Candidly, we had few offerings in the past in the building's domain, but it was a very point solution approach. It was not outcomes based. And, and here we are uh, launching the path forward. So I want to take a few minutes to walk you through what we are doing uh, in this space and how exciting this could be in terms of uh, outcomes that we'll achieve for our customers. And you've, you've seen some of the customer testimonials that Kevin talked about and, and, and what our customers are set out to achieve. So if you go to the next page, uh, in fact, I have the control here. Uh, let's remind ourselves about the trends in, in the building's domain. Uh, one of the greatest thing about working with Honeywell and in the building's domain is that we are in over 10 million buildings. That has given us great visibility into the customer challenges and that really truly informs our product strategy and in terms of what, what we need to go solve for and what our roadmaps should look like. So when you look at the first uh, trend, it, no surprises sustainability is top of mind. We've heard about that time and again this morning, uh, and that is where we need to go solve for. Buildings contribute to 37% of the global emissions. So it's not just a, a thing to do, it's a responsibility for Honeywell and our customers to move the needle in the space and help reduce uh, emissions and bring that number down. Uh, more than an obligation and a responsibility to go work on sustainability, it's, uh, it's becoming a mandate. Over 140 countries have mandates and regulations around the energy uh, uh, reduction and, and uh, achieving ESG goals. That's, a, that's, a, that's one piece that we need to make sure our customers are staying on top of those regulations and, and guidelines, and our products need to stay on top of that to make sure we, the, the customers are achieving that. The third piece is uh, around uh, you know, operational efficiencies. The cost of downtime is expensive depending on where the customer is and the, and the vertical they're operating in. So how do you keep asset uptime and minimize the downtime so that our customers are achieving uh, their goals? And then the fourth piece is around threats around OT, OT cybersecurity that we've talked, uh, heard our colleagues talk about and our customers talk about, but also physical uh, security of the, of the asset in the building. Uh, and there's a lot happening there in terms of making sure we are, our products are helping our customers achieve those goals. So those mega trends ultimately inform the outcomes that we have worked uh, for Honeywell Forge for Buildings. The, the six outcomes that you, you just saw in the video informs our strategy. First is sustainability. That's all about carbon and energy reduction, healthier spaces, and helping our customers achieve those outcomes. The second is around uh, safety and security. It's, it's about 
protecting the physical uh, assets and OT cyber security. The third is around resiliency, building resiliency around the buildings and the assets and, and, and helping our customers achieve that uptime. Fourth is around operational efficiency. Asset uptime enables better outcomes, better, better energy uh, reduction uh, goals that our customers are, are, are set to achieve. It's not just asset, but it's also worker productivity that you heard uh, some of my uh, colleagues talk about in other uh, domains. Uh, the fifth is around occupant experience. Ultimately, uh, peop there are people in the buildings. We all are here, we, we, we come to work. We need that experience to be world class. We need to feel safe. We need to be efficient and productive where we work and where we live. And, and the last piece is around compliance. We talked about regulations and how the customer, our customers need to stay on top of that and how can our products help achieve that. Ultimately, these six outcomes are informed by the, by the markets we operate in, by the customers that have helped us get there. And this is Honeywell Porsche for buildings going forward. If you look at these outcomes, they're intertwined. To achieve uh, occupant comfort while maintaining your energy consumption at the, at, the high, at the most optimal level, you need your assets to be in, in its healthiest state. You need outcomes and solutions that are interoperable that work coherently to achieve those outcomes. And the only way to go get there is through Honeywell Forge that brings these capabilities together across assets class, asset class, across uh, vendors that operate in, in those buildings. But Honeywell Forge is the binding factor, is the common thread that can bring it all together. And hence, we are so excited here today to, to go on this journey with, with you all to achieve these outcomes. And the last piece is why Honeywell? We, why should we, anyone partner with us? And this is something that I also speak on behalf of my other colleagues, Taylor and Sunil and, and Michael, everyone who talked about different aspects of the Honeywell Forge portfolio. There are three aspects. First is performance. We have outcome-based solutions instead of point solutions. We have performed uh, with specific ROIs, outsized, outsized ROIs. Uh, we have domain in the buildings we have operated uh, globally, millions of buildings domain expertise in control systems across asset classes, et cetera. Uh, second is partnerships. We have more than 10,000 plus partners that help us develop these solutions and, and go to market. Uh, they've helped us innovate uh, in this space. Uh, the third is uh, proven. We have, a, we have proven in this domain with decades of experience in millions of buildings we've been uh, and that has helped us inform our, our strategy, like I mentioned before. Ultimately, this is part of our, the Honeywell DNA. We have, we have proven ourselves with, with our decades of experience. We have performed with our outcome-based solutions, and we have partnerships globally to help us get there. And this is, this is, this is why our Honeywell can bring solutions to life. And uh, I would love to introduce Manish here, uh, who will take us through the pro product launches uh, in this session of Honeywell Connect for Buildings Domain. With that, over to you, Manish. <clears throat> Thank you, Sadiq. I'm really thrilled and excited to be here uh, to use this as Connect event as a core platform for launching our three flagship product, which, which is kind of coming out now. So let's start with that, you know. So before I jump into this product, I would like to kind of talk about few trends again, which you have heard in the forum today from uh, multiple people. Sustainability is one of the critical area which we are, Honeywell is putting a lot of effort, which we have heard multiple times. Now what's happening in sustainability? What driving the change in sustainability? What really making the difference? Why it is so important today? I think if you look at the three different angle of it, the first one is the electrification. I think we have seen the huge change happening in the marketplace, 30% year over year growth happening in the electrification area. How it impacts to the building industry? Two ways, you have electric vehicle cars which is coming to the, your office and second one, you are all moving from gas to the electric boiler, electric heating system and that shift is happening in much rapid phase of 30% growth. Second trend which is uh, very important which you heard a little bit of from our other colleagues is our uh, the standards and regulation it is changing much, much rapidly, much, much faster. We have seen those changes across the world. And the challenging part there is, it is going to be different in the different countries. There are some common 
factor, but there are some di differences in across the globe when you see the way each country is driving those standards and regulations. And the third piece which you heard that you know we have um, each of these uh, uh, the, the, our corporate offices and then there is a kind of a little bit of a pressure, peer pressure to go and announce the sustainability goal. Everybody is announcing and uh, some people are ahead of the journey where you have the infrastructure, the, uh, the organization in place and where you have the people in place and you have plan in place, but some people are in very, very early stage in the journey. So combination of all these three really ask us a question, okay, what are we doing to help this world to really create the best environment? and solve the problem of our corporate, solve the problem for the people and solve the pro problem for this planet. So I'm thrilled to announce that we are launching our carbon and energy management solution for our buildings technologies and this is going to be completely driven by the AI ML based solution and uh, it, it let me kind of little bit walk you through what it does. So if you see the right side of the chart, Honeywell has uh, developed uh, a kind of a a model which breaks the building into the pieces of the different assets. Why we do that? We believe that we would like to focus on the critical asset which really makes a difference to your building in terms of energy, in terms of performance and in terms of the, the criticality of that asset for your business processes inside the building. So let's take an example here what you see here that uh, the building, the, the premium commercial building, what you see that predominantly top three or four asset which is HVAC and the lighting and uh, uh, plug loads and some of the, those assets really makes the huge difference for your complete portfolio of, uh, of electricity consumption. Now the Honeywell Forge plays a very important role here which has developed those asset model in, the, in, in our platform and that asset models are contains all the information and data related to these assets which is coming from the different so different part of the building what does it do it helps you to really provide you the information for to monitor the building at the granular level where you can go at the asset level and see what amount of carbon and emission is happening in each of the assets further down we have our uh, platform, we have our carbon energy management solution has ability to connect with multiple BMS system. It's agnostic and that's the, one of the unique part which we bring to the customers where we are not equipment owner, but that gives us the ability, that gives us the, the real uh, uh, the capability to connect to the different BMS system. And what it helps, it helps to really bring all the different assets, all the different data points, all the different metering information to analyze, to monitor and analyze. Further down, if we go into this product, this is not just about the monitoring giving you insights and having you the baseline to really plan to reduce your carbon and reduce an energy in a very, very systematic manner. But also, it has an optimization capability which is really powered by our Forge AI ML engine and helps you to drive that how you can optimize the energy in the real time basis. And that's another area which I want to highlight why this asset model is critical for us to be part of this platform because this is helping you to do the real time analytics and providing you outcome in the real time basis. Because buildings, the way it operates, it is not constant on a every day. It changes hour by hour, it changes day by day. Let's go to the next one which we, I want to talk about what we are doing in the, the outcome which is we are delivering for the operational efficiency. If you look at, uh, uh, again I will build on the same basis what I talked about the assets. So we have built the asset model, now we leverage, we use that for a multiple reason. Second here, the what we are talking operational efficiency, where first thing as a building owner or a facility manager what you worry about in a building you are worried about your kpis what are the kpis your comfort energy asset availability and service case management all those kpis are critically important for any facility owner or facility manager this platform allows you to visualize all those 
information in a very granular manner and also it detects the fault and creates a service case automatically to address the fault. And that is an important part because it is analytical driven outcome, it is not just dashboarding. And uh, it also helps you to drill down at the lowest level to diagnose the issues and all the faults what you can uh, find in the asset level. Second, it, we have built a pretty good uh, uh, the rules here. What, what does it, what, what, what are the rules here? Rules are collection of the information and collection of learning which we deploy to the customer location and use our domain expertise to build for creating the, uh, for finding the fault ahead of the time. And that is a continuous process which we are building on our library. We have 250 plus rule at this point of time and that really helps these rules uh, to keep our assets uh, uptime is much higher and uh, these rules also allows you to optimize on a periodic manner in, in terms of the, our library what we are building because this is something which is continuous journey and our analytical platform helps to optimize, uh, help to develop these rules all the time and upgrade that. Finally, I want to talk about that we have, Honeywell is a controls company. We do have uh, sensorization sense, uh, system from the long time. Some of the assets which is uh, old in nature where you don't have enough information and data to analyze and uh, uh, use that for that detecting the fault. We have developed or uh, we have formed a uh, sensorization technology which helps to bring the information from each of the asset which also helps you to do the prediction model much ahead of the time before asset fails. So all in all, overall what you look at, we help our customer to reduce OPEX, CAPEX, have higher energy efficiency and increase the asset life through this product. Let us go to the, the last one, the third one which is also equally important. So we talk about the energy, we talk about the assets uptime, let us talk about the people. We all do care about the people, we all do care about the occupant inside the building. Honeywell has been in this industry from a long time, we do have a uh, best experience we provide to our occupant, to our visitors, to our vendors and just a little bit deep dive on what we are doing for our uh, the visitors and uh, our, our uh, uh, occupant. So on the real time basis, it helps you to validate the compliance management. Think about it as a visitor, you are coming to, going to a facility. You will get to know ahead of the time information that what form to be filled and once that form is filled, as a facility owner, as a, uh, as a, uh, I am an owner of the building, I would like to make sure that all compliance policies has been followed. So that is the first thing we do and it is done ahead of the time so you no have rushed to come there and do it. So compliance management and the security access has been provided for the given time when you are allowed to enter inside the building. Second one is it has that complete uh, connectivity with all the different access control system in the world. It has all the major access control system where you can be connected and through that connectivity you can look at that how you can get the mobile credential, you can have barcode, you can have the mobile QR code, all of different technology which has been supported th through this product and you will get the complete frictionless experience to when you get inside the building and just show it, swipe it and get inside the building and you can ready to be much more productive to uh, inside the building. Uh, the last piece here is it is all about you know as we have built this platform, as we build this product, we follow very very stringent policy of our the cyber security to be considered. It has to be secured, it has to be managed well so that this, this uh, whole data and information what we are collecting and gathering is not being shared or not being leaked out. It is, it is ex extremely important for us to follow those standards and policy for these products uh, when we develop. So uh, that is, so I think that is, that is the kind of a three product which I wanted to briefly cover. Now let us jump into the customers. I think uh, um, as, as you can, um, as you can see that uh, our uh, global worth which we have recent won and uh, Dennis who is the CEO, what he is saying? He said we are investing in Honeywell Forge for building for its ability to integrate systems, improve maintenance and save energy with the aim of helping us to optimize our selected building operation. Such a nice way to kind of uh, uh, 
uh, have this uh, customers to be part of our journey through the for this all outcomes over to sadik no thank you manish for uh, walking through the through the launches here uh, in this session we're looking forward to partner with you all and uh, this exciting journey for Honeywell Porch for Buildings going forward. With that, I would like to pass it over to Kevin Dayhoff uh, for a wrap here. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome back President and CEO Kevin Dayhoff. Well, um, yeah, we've uh, we've reached the end of the uh, the program. I would like to thank all of you uh, who have uh, stayed with us over the last three hours. I would say that uh, we've covered a, a lot of ground, and uh, you know it's my hope that uh, this was a valuable session uh, for you all. That uh, we've piqued your interest in what you know what kind of impact is possible, um, and uh, hopefully helped you to understand a little bit better what uh, problems we're solving with Forge and uh, in particular the value uh, associated with our, uh, with our Forge solutions. I would um, especially like to thank our customers who uh, took time out of their busy days to, uh, to join us. And um, you know, there's no substitute uh, for, uh, for hearing some of these stories through the eyes of our uh, of our customers, and uh, I can tell you that I come away inspired um, by uh, you know what we're doing, uh, how we're working with customers, and um, you know I'd say most importantly uh, the results that we're having. Um, I um, you know I, I mentioned at the beginning of the the program that one of our objectives uh, with Connect is. Uh, is to create a bit of a network. Um, and um, I would encourage uh, everyone to, uh, to utilize that network, to, uh, to stay in touch, uh, reach out to your Honeywell uh, connections, and um, you know, further explore uh, what is possible with our, uh, with our products. And you know, most certainly, as you have questions, um, please don't, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out. I would say, secondly, um, give us feedback um, on uh, on this session. Um, as I said, we're um, we're committed to uh, to holding two Connect events per year. Um, we want them to be valuable. Uh, so let us know um, what you like, what didn't you like, what could we improve, and uh, what uh, additional topics. Um, you know, would be would be most helpful, and uh, I think with that, I'd just like to. Um, I think with that, I'd just like to uh, remind everyone and uh, put a little bit of a placeholder out there for our uh, our fall launch. It will um, it will be October tenth through the twelfth. It will uh, be in Dallas, uh, Texas, uh, and uh, it'll be a live event. Uh, we look very much look forward to uh, to getting this group together face to face, and um, I can assure you uh, we'll have some uh, some additional exciting new products, new innovations, and um, you know we'll continue to explore um, you know what is possible in some of these critical areas of digitalization and sustainability and um, and ultimately safety and uh, and security so there's a QR, uh, QR code up here uh, feel free to uh, to scan it uh, stay in touch and um, in addition to locking down the date we'll be uh, communicating quite regularly around uh, you know the topics and how the uh, the agenda will evolve and so um, with that, I would just say a, a big thank you to all of the uh, participants, uh, all of the speakers, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>